Uh, good morning and uh, welcome to our regular meeting scheduled for uh, November 19th, 2019. To start off the meeting, let's have the Pledge of Allegiance led by Supervisor Jim Gillio. Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> yeah. Acknowledge certificate of posting. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> 5-0. Uh, presentations and recognitions. Seeing we have uh, none, we'll go into uh, public comment. This is an opportunity to address the board on items of interest not appearing on the agenda. No action may be taken unless provided by Government Code Section 5495.4.2. Do we have any speaker cards? Yes, we do. First speaker is Victor Gomez. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairman Medina, members of the of the board. Victor Gomez uh, here representing ZBest Composting and Zanker Recycling. Um, I do government affairs and land use consulting for uh, for my client. Um, I'm here just to let you know that we are still um, in the environmental review process for the expansion of ZBest along Highway 25 in Santa Clara County. Uh, we have the application submitted with the planning department. <clears throat> I know there's been a few issues that have come up around transportation uh, and infrastructure improvements to, to the frontage of ZBest composting. Uh, so I just wanted to come up here and let you know that, <clears throat> excuse me, that if you have any questions uh, related to the expansion project, please connect with me. All of you have my cell phone number, my email address. Uh, we expect an administrative draft uh, of the EIR to be uh, likely completed in the January timeframe. 
um, and at that time I would probably think it would be appropriate uh, to come before you and do a presentation uh, on those mitigations that may have to occur for the expansion of the project. So if you have any questions between now and then, uh, feel free to let me know. Um, I have been updating uh, your RMA director um, as well on those issues, uh, but if any issues do come up, uh, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Craig Venturini. My name is Craig Venturini. I live on McGladry Road, which is up off a of Lone Tree. A few weeks ago, I had a fella come to my door and notify me that this outfit called uh, Therapeutic, they are Summit Therapeutic, and they're opening two crisis centers on our dead end road. They bought two parcels of ag land, <laughs> and they are bringing in um, patients over there that have uh, violent tendencies, according to them. So, I know that you're not aware of it, but I've had a couple of meetings with the neighbors and Mark has been so kind as to come over. <coughs> He's gave, given us some information. The information being that there's nothing we can do about it. And you, you're not even eligible to be uh, on the list of being notified that they're there just as much as we're not being eligible. We are described in their documentation, the state documentation, as being NIMBYs people that stand up and say that oh, not in my backyard people. They have uh, written in their documentation over and over again how to combat NIMBYs or people that live in a neighborhood that may want to know something about this or, or object to it. Uh, it gets to the point that has been in there so many times where it's almost like we're being discriminated against. I know there's nothing you can do here for us because the county has been circumvented and these folks have been able to do this. We live on a dead end street. <coughs> There's another fellow here that he'll, he'll describe more in detail about what goes on in that house. But I just want you to be aware of the fact that, you know, that we have had, and Mark will tell you that I have had a lot of people in my house in these two meetings and none of the neighbors are happy about this at all. We just kind of got blindsided by this. But you're, you, I would really hope that with this happening that you guys would get something with the state that at least you would be notified and to be able to have a public meeting on what's going on in our backyard. They are um, going to open another one of these in San Juan Batista, from what I understand. Um, I've talked to an appraiser. The appraiser says you have to disclose this if you're going to sell your real estate. And they says that uh, anywhere from... Uh, 46 to 50 percent of the people that would probably want to buy a house in there that would discourage them from doing so. So you've already lost that. And appraisal values would probably go down, but you can't judge that until somebody actually sells their property and you see what, what goes on. But all this, you know, we've, I've lived there since 1985, <coughs> and there's been 14 new homes put on that little dead end road, and now you have this because you have these patients plus their counselors or whatever they are and then you have people cooking or whatever but the the traffic thank is you. on the road thank you sir thank you oh, thank you Greg Reed you can continue we left off good morning my name is Greg Reed I'm Craig's neighbor I also live on McGladry and what he's talking, I'm going I'm to hand out some brochures to you. What he's talking about is a crisis home for severely mental patients. In their flyer, they describe psychotic behavior. Came to a surprise to us. There was no meetings. All of a sudden, the guy invites us to the open house. I, I witnessed the open house where they count the knives. They lock up the knives. It's designed so you can't hang yourself. It has, uh, everything is bolted down. There are foam pads with handles on them to, as a shield to protect themselves when they're being attacked. This is what's coming into our neighborhood, two of them, both million dollar homes. They house four patients. There'll be a caregiver for each patient on two shifts and one that spends the night. At minimum, there'll be 36 cars Four coming in the day shift, four going home on day shift. Four swing, four going home on swing. 
36 more times will cars be on our block. Not only that, the reduction, our, our home values have gone down. They've taken, we estimate, um, we've had an appraiser and real estate agent say, you've lost probably $10,000 on a million dollar home, that's $100,000. Nobody here knows about it. Let me ask you, Jim, did you know anything about this? We can't respond in public comment, but uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm learning about this in the last week Anthony, or so. No. No. So Mark, what happened to the collaboration? You said you collaborated with your, your, your peers. I don't see any. I, I, one of the questions I asked was, do you guys, if it's his district, is he alone or do you collaborate? I would, I, we're reaching out for you guys for some help. This thing is biased against the homeowner. It is discrimination. Everything is, Senate Bill 2 describes it. Shortage of mental health facilities, so they fast track them. They don't have to comply with zoning or any regulations. This, we're in ag land, five acre minimum. Now there's businesses out there housing psychotic mental patients. You know, part of me feels for them. They got to go somewhere, and and they have, they do call us NIMBYs. They have a whole defense against us. Eighty-four pages of how to deal with people that don't like it. They, this company, Beria Housing Corporation, has seventy-four homes. They know what they're doing. They came into this county with nobody knowing. The mayor didn't know. None of you guys know. And all of a sudden, here we are. I don't know why the planning commission or anybody didn't. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Didn't uh, report it, but um, we're not happy. And uh, we're looking for some help. I would like to see you guys collaborate. Put your heads together. Help us out. You're our elected officials. And there's an election coming up. Um, Revis, he's a state. Maybe we need state. Thank you. Can I hand these flyers out real quick? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So they each get one of these. Okay. Uh, department head announcements, information only. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we do have an announcement out of County Council's office. Oh, uh, on the consent agenda number eight, there was a minor typo that was corrected, which was uh, changing the date on the top of the resolution to 2019. Uh, it was listed as 2018 in the board packet. I'd like to invite up uh, Chris Mangano. She is our interim OES manager. She has a quick announcement for your board. Good morning. I just wanted to mention that we have a, another PG&E power shutoff beginning tomorrow. San Benito County is not included in the footprint this time, um, but it will affect Santa Clara and Santa Cruz counties. So we're watching it closely and participating in the conference calls. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I'd like to invite up our auditor controller, Joe Paul Gonzalez. Good morning, Chair, Board of Supervisors. I have a, um, I'm very pleased to, uh, to announce today that yesterday the county's comprehensive annual financial report, the CAFR, uh, was completed the first draft that was completed and submitted to our external auditors so they will uh, and this is the uh, the earliest that uh, we've ever completed it um, I, I was hoping that um, my staff would uh, would come down uh, you know to uh, so I can acknowledge them uh, Leanne Godinez who is the assistant auditor controller uh, she she really uh, pushed pushed hard to get this done she you know we had the cooperation of the auditor accountants who worked uh, tirelessly to um, to ensure that this got this was completed but I also wanted to here they are right right now <laughs> I promised them that coming down here we wouldn't uh, we, we wouldn't deduct that from their break <laughs> you yeah, know this is Leanne Godinez and and uh, this is the auditor accountant staff here that, um, you know, actually performed the work. And I'd like to acknowledge them for uh, <clears throat> publicly for, for doing a great job and, and getting it done. And I, and I know that th this is exactly what the board has been, you know, seeking for, for years now. Yeah. 
Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I just want to con congratulate the auditor and, and the staff and, and a big thank you to all the department heads for cooperating this year and because I know this has been a source of oh, yeah. real, real heartburn for us in, in the past and uh, thank you very much. It's a big deal. Very good job. Thank you. That's the other thing. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. I was uh, about to mention that um, the fact that the department heads collaborated uh, with with the auditor's office and that collaboration made all the difference because it's you know every day that goes by is another day that we need we need that time and I'd like to acknowledge uh, Harry Marvagenis who uh, you know he, he just came into the county but he understood uh, our needs and what the board wanted and you know he really helped facilitate that process with the RMA. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. I'd like to invite up Dulce Alonzo, our management analyst in administration. Morning board. Um, recently, uh, CAO I and a uh, planning commissioner and um, EDC attended the Opportunities Zone Conference, and um, San Benito actually has a, a, a really big Opportunity Zone um, assigned in our jurisdiction. And um, so, I just wanted you guys to be aware of that. And we will be bringing more information regarding Opportunity Zone and what that means. Um, at this time, it's deferred. Um, federal taxes at the um, federal level and not the state, but um, yeah, we we have a, a region designated within our jurisdiction. Thank you. So just to add to that, so um, we look to to come back to your board uh, probably in the next few months, and and also during the board retreat, uh, we'd like to invite a few speakers that we heard and uh, present to your board. It was a wealth of information. The state was there. They understand the importance and, and, and the treasury. So it was really a really um, great presentation. Just wanted to make sure the board was aware of it and um, as well as the public. <clears throat> so with that being said, I believe that's all the announcements we have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Going to our uh, consent agenda. Any items wish to be pulled from the board? Number 13, Mr. Chair. Number 13. Anyone else? From the uh, public? Seeing none, we will uh, pull 13. What's the wish of the board? I'll move to approve the consent agenda with uh, 13 being excluded. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero. Mr. Chair. Um, I, I mean, it's okay if you don't want to do the board announcements, but you can wait till later for do it at the end. Do it at the end is fine. Just wanted to make sure the board was yeah. here. Thirteen. Chris McDonald. So, Mr. Chair, I asked for uh, thirteen to be pulled. I, I just wanted <coughs> to have a brief understanding of the background and the reason for the uh, the larger than average uh, CPI increase this year. I did review the uh, agenda item in thorough and met with um, our CAO and uh, our uh, interim director of OES to learn about more about this and the increases and and the bottom line is um i'm sure we'll hear it today is the uh the uh reimbursement rate for um, our private ambulance provider amr is down to 13 percent roughly um plus or minus so what that does for them is if you think about it every dollar you you bill you collect 13 cents so um, that with uh, some other uh, increases in the cost of doing business have caused them to uh, be actually, if you look at their quarterly financial statements for this year, uh, I happen to have them in front of me. Um, they show a loss in quarter one of, this is just for our, our area, loss of quarter one for 51,000, <coughs> quarter two, 33,000, quarter three, 22,000. So um, 
think that's uh, some of the information that I was able to gather over the last couple of days, and I just wanted to hear more directly from AMR about the background and the reasons for the increase, and then also uh, just a general idea of how things are going in our community and what the staffing levels are, because we, when we initiated the uh, contract and executed it, we had some concerns with um, the uh, quick response vehicle, ambulance, ALS, BLS, and all those things, so I figured now would be a good time. Thank you. Perfect. So good morning again, and thank you. I will introduce to you Michael Eslinger. He is the district manager uh, for AMR, um, and he has some specifics for you. Thank you. Honorable board members, thank you for the opportunity to address you today. Um, my name is Mike Eslinger. I am the regional director for AMR, and I can give you some insight. I mean, those are uh, definitely very legitimate questions to be asking. You know, we're asking for a 20.3 uh, increase in our base rates. Um, one of the biggest drivers that we had, is, as you brought up, is that we had a very significant staffing crisis last year. And one of the challenges that we had is that we actually dropped down to only two paramedics. We had to rely on uh, outside counties to help us uh, with our daily staffing levels. And we, what we found was is that one of the significant drivers had to do with just the wages um, you know, for our staff here we found that uh, San Benito County, the wages for our paramedics and EMTs were about 30 to 40 percent less than what we saw in Monterey County, uh, Santa Clara, and then also um, Santa Cruz County. So we made what we felt was a very important adjustment to those wages. Um, it helped with our recruitment and our retention. We also actually created our own paramedic school. Um, we put, we uh, provided one uh, full scholarship for an EMT here. We plan to um, actually put up a new school in 2020, and we will put up a minimum of one EMT to actually go through that program as well. Um, one of the questions behind the, um, uh, you know, the, the collection rates is that we have a very small payer pool here, meaning that we run about six calls a day, just over 2,000 uh, transports a year. And we, when we raise our rates, our Medi-Cal and Medicare rates are actually fixed, meaning that regardless of what we charge and how we raise those rates, we cannot collect any, you know, any increased amounts from those payer groups. So we rely on a very small mix of patients, the private insured patients, um, and also private pay patients to offset those expenses. So while it is unfortunate, um, I do recognize that it's a, a difficult thing when we raise rates that significantly um, I feel that we've made a lot of important changes to our operations, and a lot of them were actually very necessary to keep, ret you know, retaining paramedics and EMTs. One, one of the things I noticed in the contract uh, is that your profit is capped at 8%. Does That's that true. change this at all? Uh, no, it doesn't change it at all. And any, you know, if we are able to exceed that cap, um, you know, that, those funds actually go back into the county. And, and just, uh, you know, looking at the report also, what is your, your, I guess you would call it your delinquency rate, how much do you actually collect per dollar when everything's said and done? Well, right now, you know, our average collections are about 13.2%. That's the last 12-month average. But remember that with such a small payer group that, you know, it's not unusual for it to shift significantly over the course of the year. So that means for every dollar that is billed, you receive 13 pennies. That's, that's exactly it. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I have a question, I guess, for staff. How, how are we absorbing this uh, increase? Uh, are we using any of the CSA 31 uh, funding? Actually, the increase is not a county-absorbed um, responsibility. It's billed to the customer that's transported. So okay. the 20% increase is their billing rate. It's, it doesn't affect the county at all. All right. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> so the 20% is being charged to the end user, I just and you have a rate of how much you can collect right now? Uh, right now, our uh, it's 13.2 is our collection rate. So that rate should go up, I imagine. Definitely, yes. That's our hope. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna have a hard, you're gonna have more people who can't afford. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one of yeah. What happens in a small community? It's yeah. a very rural, small community. And you will not deny anyone the uh, 
regardless of the ability to pay or not. Never. Right? They no. don't know what the insurance is of the patient until their okay. patient's at the hospital. Okay. It's not something that's even questioned. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Bring it, uh, any public comment? Good morning, Mr. Chair and um, Supervisors. So I was here uh, when they were kind of when they were trying to get the new contract, and I spoke out against it. And I'm definitely going to speak out against this 20% increase. There are people out there that are one check from being homeless, not being able to pay the rent. An additional 20% people file for bankruptcy because they can't pay their medical bills, and add another 20% to the ambulance bill. This is ridiculous. This just means that they get to write off more on their taxes than they do. This is a for-profit company. This is not a non-profit, and we know this. They have a monopoly on us. We tried to go to somewhere else, and apparently they won the contract, and I was totally against it, and there's no way that we can go out and get another. Can't remember who uh, Gilroy uses and Santa Clara County uses right now, but this will only hurt the person that's going to be using this. This is not going to hurt the county. This is all it means is that if it costs a dollar, it's going to cost a dollar twenty now for somebody to go out there. That's just a dollar twenty more that this person cannot pay. There are some of us that are fortunate that have insurance, and then and they can pay that, and they have to accept what it is that the insurance is willing to pay because the insurance knows exactly to the dollar what they're supposed to pay. Medicare and Medi-Cal do the same thing. Please reconsider this or. Put it off and think about it before you make a decision today. Thank you. Any other, bring it back to the board, any questions? What's the wish of the board? I make a move we um, move forward with item number 13, as stated. Is there a second? Mr. Chair, I will second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 No. I'm voting no, too. Three, two? Three, two. Mr. Chair, I, I would request that uh, we continue to study this item. The reason why I chose to support it now is that we need to have an ambulance provider in our county and we don't really have a lot of options right now so we need to continue to study this item into the future and i would ask our staff to stay on this and pay very close attention to this and bring it back to our board at the beginning of the year um i i, I want to agree with supervisor gilio we should continue studying this uh issue a 20 percent increase is substantial but um i also kind of think that you know, we all pay taxes uh, in CSA um, 31. I think that's that advanced life support uh, CSA. And maybe there's a, another way of uh, uh, funneling, um, you know, some some monies yeah. towards the, the advanced life support uh, program, the paramedic wages. I did, I did have a chance to speak with the uh, uh, AMR representative and we uh I, I we do relate with the cost of salaries going up and the problem of retaining uh qualified staff but uh maybe we could continue to study studying this issue yeah okay we'll put it we'll on make, the we'll make sure for we'll the first meeting in uh, january we'll make sure that happens thank you mr chair if i may um <coughs> just to piggyback off what supervisor gillo and uh Batella have mentioned Ultimately, to me, this is an issue of, of solvency or being able to have a, a, a program that works that's going to last a long time. And, you know, there's been obviously a lot of issues with having, you know, uh, adequate pay rates for different departments all across the board. So ultimately, this is just addressing one element for AMR. But at the end of the day, we, we want to have a strong opportunity to serve our public and, for, you know, ultimately to save lives. And if we don't have a good program, then we, that's not going to happen. Mr. Chair, my concern, I've always said this and since the day I was a supervisor, that because 
the majority of the uh, low-income family members or Latino family have a tendency to live in the farthest away from these centers, that timing will be a consideration. I want to make sure that time is not taken, it's not compromised on this. I want to make sure of that. Okay. okay. We'll go off to our regular agenda. Start off with... Uh, Number 20. Um, this item is to present the uh, clerk, county clerk, auditor, recorder, elections officials um, certification of the referendum petition. The uh, related items relating to the referendum petition are included on item 21. So this was just basically accepting the certification only. Chair, Board of Supervisors, the, uh, this, this is the certificate of the referendum petition. Uh, I just want to um, point out that the referendum was, um, was actually 159.4% and that the, uh, the number of statistically valid signatures was 3,284. That exceeded the um, referendum statistically um, a statistic uh, base level 110 percent of required signatures according to election code so this is a qualified referendum okay that was uh, just informational correct no you can public comment and then you would take a motion to accept the, the okay. certification public comment Wayne Norton. oh item 21 okay any other public comment for 20? Okay, bring it back to the board. Any questions, concerns? Mr. Chair, if you're prepared to accept the motion, I'm prepared to move my motion. Prepared. Uh, I, I move that we accept the county clerk's certification <coughs> of the referendum petition <coughs> regarding ordinance 991. I'll second that motion, Mr. Chair. All in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero, it passes. Thank you. We'll go on to number uh, 21. Okay, so now that the, the, the referendum petition has been certified, the board has two options. One is that they can um, reconsider and repeal Ordinance 991, which was adopted relating to the textual um, part of the C3 zoning, which was the part that was challenged by the referendum petition. Or the board can adopt a resolution calling for an election on the matter. So it's a two-part issue. Um, and there is an attached... Uh, resolution calling for the election if the board wanted to proceed with calling for the election the ballot measure is set forth on page 645 it's a um, short ballot measure which uh, states the uh, the text that would be presented to the voters um, we've set it up so the complete text would not be published in the um, ballot pamphlet but it's going to be available online it'd be available upon request there's also a section that talks about the fiscal analysis that could be requested by the board. That's totally optional by the board. It's discretionary from the board's perspective. And I have two resolutions, one of which would call for the fiscal analysis to be performed and the second one, which would omit that. So um, that's another decision point for the board. This election would be consolidated with the March 3rd, 2020 um, primary election and um, I'm available for any questions or I can explain further if you would like. Well, I'll, so I'll, take, I'll take the lead real quick. You know, what I'm looking at is it's very uh, obvious that the votes or the signatures were obtained. I would uh, personally, for me, move ahead with the uh, election on March 3rd of 2020. And as for the fiscal analysis, I personally cannot uh, see doing a fiscal analysis simply because it's all speculative. We have no idea what is going to be there. So for me, it's with the election 2020 and no analysis. Mr. Chair, I, yes, sir. I would whole, wholeheartedly support this item going to the public for a vote and not seek a fiscal analysis. It's just the people went out and got signatures and I think we need to comply with their wishes. Supervisor Hernandez. I agree. 
Supervisor <coughs> uh, Mr. Chair, initially I agree. I'd, I'd really like to hear a public comment to um, see if there's any other thoughts or ideas out there before I make my final decision, but yes, I agree. Yes, sir. I'm going to reserve uh, my comments to after public comment as well. Yes, okay, we'll go to public comment. Uh, good morning. Thank you, uh, Chairman Medina and board. Um, my name is Wayne Norton, and I live in Aromas. And um, unlike usual, I've made a few notes uh, because this is a, an important issue. Um, many of the folks who signed the petition that you're talking about today are friends and neighbors of mine. They're good people. They have legitimate concerns about development along Highway 101. Traffic, loss of open space, effect on water resources, and protection of Native American sacred sites, how development might change the rural nature of our area, and others are issues that must be resolved before any development uh, is approved on Highway 101. To be clear, I know that the petition before you will not stop development. The issue today is about the zoning <coughs> standards that will be applied to applications for development along the highway. C3 zoning regulations approved unanimously by this board are a better a tool than current regulations and are designed to ensure the Highway 101 development are well planned, meets exacting design standards, and protects the environment, environmental resources and open space. What is needed is a robust role for public oversight. I have advanced a plan for a Highway 101 design review committee made up of West County citizens that would be given an official voice in the Planning Commission's decision-making process. It's clear that the county needs to expand its tax base if our overburdened county budget is going to support the quality services our, our citizens need and deserve. We know the county needs to expand its tax base if we're going to pay its workers comparable wages that encourage people to apply for our open positions and stop the drain of our workers leaving for better paying jobs elsewhere. It's prudent to plan for development on Highway 101. We live in California, which is the fifth largest economy in the world, and we're right next door to Silicon Valley, which according to a Mercury News article, is in the top 20 economies in the entire world. We know highway development is coming to 101. The C3 zoning ordinance gives us the best tools we have available today and works to ensure that any <coughs> development is done in a way that adds rather than detracts from our quality of life. I urge you to protect the new zoning regulations you unanimously approved to protect our scenic highway and to send the issue to a vote. Thank you. Thank you. Natasha List. Yes, before I make my statement, which will be short, I just want to say that I completely agree with the, the two gentlemen that talked about the severely mentally ill health facilities that are going to be put in in their neighborhoods and <clears throat> this also has to do with the with the ambulance because the physical and mental health of our residents should not be held hostage to private corporations the county needs to run its own mental health facilities funded by the state government and placed where the people of this county think it's appropriate. And it's the same with the ambulances that, that have outrageous fees. They have to charge these outrageous fees because of, of the many Medi-Cal and Medicare patients that they transport. So I think that health care should be a right, not a privilege, and should not be handled by private, nonprofit, or profit corporations. And I'm going to talk about the physical impact statement that was proposed by someone. I don't know who proposed it. And I know that my supervisor has, has said, let's skip this. Well, we already know what the supervisors have said about proposed tax re revenues from the Betabel node. <clears throat> and what I'm going to ask, if this auditor is going to gather accurate information on the impact 
on the business laws in Hollister and San Juan Batista because of tourists bypassing our national park, our wineries, our San Juan Batista festivals. And I'd like to remind you that the San Juan Batista City Council voted no on the nodes. Is the auditor going to present us with information on the environmental effects of degraded air wa and water quality in the years to come with all this advanced traffic? <clears throat> this board refused to update the fiscal and environmental impact reports before they voted to rezone, which of course we protested. <clears throat> in my opinion, uh, I'm, I'm asking the board to eliminate a last minute inadequate and potentially biased fiscal impact report. It's really too little and too late, and I urge the people the, the board to listen to the people. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <coughs> Jackie Morris Lopez. <coughs> Good morning, Chair and Board of Supervisors. My name is Jackie Morris Lopez. I'm a resident of San Juan Batista, a lifelong resident and <coughs> San Benito County resident. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Battleball Node development. I just want to say thank you to all the citizens in San Benito County that did take the time to educate themselves about the C3 node development and specifically the 101 corridor at this point. I thank you for your support and the signatures. And I thank you, Board, for acknowledging the validity of these signatures. Moving forward, I want to speak about the Battleball Node and the developer that is pushing this development. I am not, number one, um, tied to any development. I'm not a developer. I'm not in real estate. I don't, I'm not married to anyone in that. I have no hidden agenda, but I will disclose that I am a medical health provider. I'm a physician assistant licensed in the state of California and have been so for 20 years. What gets my claw about this development and the KSBW news spot last <coughs> night was the promotion of this node on the behalf of his deceased son that died of pediatric brain cancer. I find it very appalling that this gentleman, who is a developer, who is a developer of a cold product back in 2008 that was deemed unfair advertisement by the Federal Trade Commission and his company that did promote and develop airborne cold cure was charged to pay out $23.3 million in um, restitution for false claims, fraudulent claims. Now, what, where I'm going with this is that this note is very important to developing and kicking the door open to the rest of the 101 corridor. With that being said, looking at this gentleman's track record and the appallness of him using a dead child's dilemma to get the voters to sympathize to promote this development is just horrible. There are other better and more uh, uh, standard ways of contributing to cancer pediatric funds. Look at Bill Gates. Look at uh, Mark Zuckerberg. <coughs> this just reeks of another con by this gentleman, and I just find it very appalling that KSBW and that our supervisor, Mr. Anthony Botello, I'm sorry, sir, but I think you need to really look at the messenger here. It's just very, very sad that this gentleman is pushing through on behalf of his dead son's memory. Uh, I can't believe that 100% of the profits are going to go to cancer funding. There are other ways to, to channel that uh, in, in a way that's not political, in a way that's not tied into development and destruction of our 101 corridor. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, my name is Tom Karras, and I'm from Aromas. Uh, recently, more than 80 petition signature gatherers collected over 4,000 signatures of voters in San Benito County. Most of the voters were not aware of the commercial rezoning planned along Highway 101. <clears throat> After explaining that re rezoning ordinance 991 would allow for construction of motels shops, restaurants, and gas stations in these nodes, most of the voters signed the petition 
so they could vote against the rezoning of this ag land to commercial. Given the overwhelming sentiment against commercialization along Highway 101, I recommend that the board amend the general plan to remove the four regional commercial nodes along Highway 101. Finally, if the board decides not to repeal the ordinance, the board should put the CEQA lawsuit in abeyance until after the referendum vote. And I want to thank you for all your time and efforts on this. Thank you, sir. I'll pronounce that again. It's Jeannie Echenique. And I'm a resident of North Monterey County near Royal Oaks Park. And I drive Highway 101 a lot to get up north to San Jose and other points. And um, <coughs> I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. So I understand you have two options today to consider here and that's rescinding the C3 zoning ordinance 991 not 911 and to accept the petition and set the matter for a vote and I think the appropriate course is to rescind the C3 zoning ordinance and I have three specific reasons for that um, suggestion to you uh, the public does not believe that the establishment of the nodes was transparent or that <coughs> sufficient public involvement occurred. As Tom Karras said, most of the people that were asked to sign the petition didn't even, had never even heard of it. And I know that we got in, that the public got more informed after January 16th, even though the process had been going on since the GP work back in 2015, et cetera, but people still didn't know about it. Um, so that's the first reason why um, there was not enough transparency. Number two, um, there is supporting evidence that there may have been a conflict of interest with parties that participated in the public proceedings and creating the nodes. The FPPC, FPPC has not dismissed the cases, mm -hmm. but have said there was insufficient evidence. And they have provided a process for additional evidence to be provided to allow further investigation into the matter, which I believe will show that there is clear <coughs> conflict. So that's reason two. And number three is the cost of the election. Taxpayer money will be paying for that. And since taxpayers in general are not supporting the nodes and the ordinance, uh, it would be great if at this time you rescind it. Okay, so that's it. Um, the right thing to do is to not cost the county taxpayers any more money and to rescind the order and rethink the idea of these nodes. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh oh, we have one more. I wasn't going to speak. However, um, yeah. The people have spoken, there's petitions that were signed, and currently right now the board is saying that they're going to accept that and they're gonna put it out for an election. Um, I was approached by numerous people to sign the petition who did not know me and gave me information that was incorrect. A lot of people who signed this petition were not 100% knowing of the correct information about what was happening. If people did not know 
that this was happening. It is by their own accord because they do not pay attention to what's going on in their county. It is not something that was done behind closed doors. It is not something that was done in secret between anybody else. And there was absolutely no conflict between anybody out there, and I'm specifically talking about um, Supervisor Botello and also Dan DeVries that the, the uh, FPPC made out a, um, someone filed, and it was the lady that spoke before me that filed a uh, complaint with the FPPC. It is standard for people who disagree with a politician to right away make an accuse them of something that is improper and Ill illegal without any facts whatsoever. And I'm frankly getting really tired of it. I think you go ahead and you let the people speak and people will know exactly what this is all about and not just have half information or misinformation about the, what they will be voting for. Thank you. Thank you. We've got one more. <laughs> Valerie? Hey. San Juan Batista. And I wasn't going to speak, but I was very careful when I explained to people what they were signing. I wasn't uh, hiding it in the dark. I, I, um, I was very careful to let them know that the process had started five years ago, and, the, and we didn't find about until January. People got very concerned. People were very emotional on each side. I respect all these people. I appreciate you guys all listened to our side, made your own mind up. We went to the people. We did this. But I resent this uh, anti-democratic thing that we we're giving out, false information. That's all I wanted to say. I was trying to be as truthful as I can. And I'm not bespirking Mr. Botello or anybody else. We didn't, our group didn't go after anybody like that. We were just concerned about the process. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Valerie? Thank you. I uh, don't have a lot of endurance after being running over myself with my own truck. <laughs> However, uh, I have spoken to a number of people in my neighborhood, which is uh, in the Anzar Hills just above uh, the 101. I watch the 101 traffic every day. Um, I am very familiar with the RV park and the Y intersection where there used to be an old bus station and that was the main uh, entertainment of the day. Um, anyway, the people that I've spoken to in the neighborhood uh, have said that they were given misinformation uh, when asked to uh, sign petitions. Um, there is uh, overwhelming support uh, on School Road and Anzar Road for the continuation of development at the Better Bell because it is a beautifully designed uh, exit and entry onto the freeway. Uh, it is part of the Anza Trail, which um, can be continued from uh, the Anza Trail near the Fremont Peak. Uh, because the Anza expedition came through the San Juan Valley <coughs> and uh, went along the Pajaro and then uh, headed north on the Uvis. So uh, speaking to the National Park System uh, trail system, uh, they are ready and willing to work with uh, the plant, uh, landowner uh, to certify that area. And it would be an excellent tourist opportunity for San Juan Batista to bring people from the freeway uh, into town, directed especially by that trail. And there is, with Caltrans, a great possibility of doing a bicycle pedestrian uh, exit over the freeway and through our existing bike path and on uh, into the county where we could bring some of those bicycles that you see on many cars going south to where they are looking to enjoy Monterey. Uh, if we can bring them off. Uh, <laughs> so I get carried away with the projects that I see so much potential for, and I apologize. Uh, I just wanted to say that I believe 
in speaking to other uh, property owners along the 101 that this there is a lot of support for bringing uh, the development to the 101 for the prosperity of the county. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And I'm not trying to get sympathy over being run over, <laughs> nor do I believe this developer is trying to get sympathy for <laughs> the tragedy in their life. I believe that they are being very honest in their dealing. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no more speaker cards, we'll bring it uh, back to the. I have one more gentleman. Hi, James Starkey Wolf from Prunedale. Uh, thank you for uh, this session and um, for the uh, thanks to the uh, registrars for a very professional and fair process through the referendum. Um, I think that uh, it's a good time to uh, reflect on uh, what the uh, people have that signed the referendum have expressed. Uh, I haven't heard uh, how uh, anyone was deceived uh, by putting their signature on the referendum. And uh, I think that uh, my experience of uh, talking to a lot of people is that uh, there's a great deal of frustration with uh, and claustrophobia that people are feeling with the tremendous amount of growth in the last few years, uh, but not a uh, parallel uh, attention to the roads and being able to come in and out of the area, and especially Hollister. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Bring it back uh, to the board. We'll uh, start off with start off with uh, Supervisor Giller. Mr. Chair, I'll keep my comments brief because we've um, spoke about this at length at prior meetings. I just wanted to say that I respect the democratic process, and today I will be supporting um, moving this to the uh, election in March without a fiscal analysis. And the reason I do not support the fiscal analysis is I believe that for the comments you made earlier, it's. Um, it's too, too vague. There is only one project, I believe, that's even in a uh, tentative design phase, and the um, other projects, we don't know what's going to be there. We don't know what's proposed, what could happen, so I don't know how we could do a fiscal analysis now to include that in the other locations. And uh, thank you. I'll keep my comments brief today. Anything else, <coughs> Supervisor Hernandez? <coughs> my only comment is, is, is to encourage the, the folks involved and, and just the general public that would have a, a, a healthy and uh, you know, non-animus discourse, you know, the, the ultimately the, I believe and agree with the, the process to play out and give people an opportunity to weigh in. And my, and my biggest hope is for um, for us to have an honest intention to make sure that accurate information is being portrayed. I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, I've had two instances where people had uh, an assumption of, and they signed the petition, but I'm not even going to, it doesn't matter at this point. All I know is, is going forward, I hope that we, we have a, a better response to the public. Supervisor Dela Cruz. Yes. <coughs> yes, I just want to say thank you for coming here. Uh, the board at first approved this project, and then the members of the public went out and got signatures, and it's the democratic process for them to get signatures. They have come back and through Joe Paul, they have been certified, and therefore they will be in an election. And I will support that the election be held in March uh, election. And I want to commend you for doing a good job in reaching out to the public. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Bertello. Yeah, thank you very much. I, as mostly everyone in this room understands, I'm very passionate about this. This is my district that I've worked really hard on um, this ordinance. I felt that it. Um, provided a lot of the protections and constraints that uh, my you know district was looking for uh, I, I still believe in the c3 uh, ordinance as far as uh, you know the best way to uh, develop along the 101 corridor 
it's not a question of if or when uh, development occurs in uh, in a 101 corridor it's how and the c3 ordinance if anyone took the time to read the ordinance it it puts limitations on the property owners and that's what's kind of confounding to me is that the property owners are very much in favor of the c3 ordinance uh, they could develop through c1 c2 what uh, whatever uh, alternatives that are out there and then the people that are against the c3 are the folks that i would thought that would have supported it wholeheartedly as uh, providing the, the restraints and um, and protect our environment which was a, a ultimate goal of mine uh, in working with staff and our consultants and in, in protecting uh, our rural character and the environment and the enhancement of that area instead I do support um, since the referendum did uh, acquire the signatures I'm going to support that going to the ballot I I have regrets that uh, a lot of the signatures was from misinformation to an uninformed uh, public and um, so be it uh, it's uh, be our jobs to uh, inform the public as far as what the general plan uh, procedures and processes are and this is just a, one of the processes of uh, enacting a general plan uh, and this is not project approval by any stretch of the imagination uh, for any of the areas on the 101 as far as the fiscal analysis uh, I agree with Supervisor Gilio uh, it's really premature to expect uh, anyone to figure out what the pros and cons uh, fiscally uh, without knowing what the project is uh, and I, I did acquire over the time working with the some of the property owners what they envision um, you know at the biddable Y for instance it there could be 51 jobs created and if they um, move forward with you know perhaps a gas station mercantile uh, sales restaurant sales hotel uh, could mean about uh, one and a half million a year in taxes that's the positive side for the county that's just one node by not doing this our roads continue to deteriorate there's a fiscal analysis as far as the condition of our roads there's a fiscal analysis that should be done as far as you know uh, uh, other services in the county main uh, our employees we just heard from the ambulance company uh, just uh, a little earlier about their their troubles for retaining people we have the same problems here and this is why our roads are in the condition that they're in we don't have enough public safety uh, out there and I, I think uh, we have to move forward to, with other revenue streams uh, to meet the needs and service levels that the public expects and um, that we could do this together responsibly and so um, I think we all need to um, go forward and try to see where we could reach um, conclusions together and and go from there so that's my comments right now mr. chairman and uh, thank you with, with the wish of the board I'll, I'll make a motion to place the item on on the uh, uh, c3 referendum on the ballot in March uh, without the fiscal analysis and adopting the resolution as modified to remove the fiscal analysis paragraph yeah, yeah, yes with the addition of uh, County Council's recommendation I will second the motion all in favor aye aye, aye. five zero take a quick bathroom break yes thank you we're taking a quick bathroom break
administration office. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you Mr. Chair. Um, over the last uh, month or so, I had a, a meeting with uh, MVAO uh, Jason Cameron and his office. Went, went actually go down to his office and visit him uh, concerning veteran affairs and and how well they're doing here in our county. He gave me a great report, and I thought it was apropos uh, the month of November to have them here and and to present to your your board um, what they're doing, some of the great things that they're doing, and the staff that they have um, as well doing a great job here. And I, I thought it was uh, be a good time for you to actually present. So, Jason, <clears throat> thank you so much, Ray. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the entire board. I appreciate uh, being able to be put on the calendar uh, today uh, in this month of November, which is the month of Veterans Day and the Marine Corps birthday, by the way. Uh, so I am a, a, a Marine Corps veteran uh, four years. I was also in the Army uh, for another six years uh, after that in the reserves. Uh, in addition, I also uh, worked in the California uh, Military Department. A lot of folks don't know that there's a military department in California. But uh, that's where the National Guard lives for California. I worked there uh, helping uh, um, veterans, uh, post 9-11 veterans, um, reservist National Guards folks uh, find employment throughout the state. Um, today, I'm the Director of Military and Veterans Affairs for this uh, county of San Benito, as well as Monterey. So both counties are under our jurisdiction, for lack of a better word. And um, what I wanted to do today with uh, the support of uh, Ray is uh, go ahead and give a uh, kind of a high level overview of what it really means to have this component within the county and what value we bring not only to the veterans of this county but to the county as, as a whole and I uh, brought with me Joe Ferrodi uh, he is the management analyst for the military and veterans affairs office and so I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to him and uh, let him run with it thank you so much uh, thank you, Board, and uh, thank you, Mr. Espinosa, for this opportunity today. Um, Jason asked me to speak about veteran services before San Benito County, and I can be very verbose about veteran services. And so what I did was I developed a script uh, to make sure that I stay on topic uh, to, to share the relevant information. Um, so good morning, all supervisors. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be able to present to you this morning. As a San Benito High School graduate, class of 1995, a former U.S. Naval officer, and as the current analyst for Monterey and San Benito County Veterans Service Office, I extend my respect and gratitude. Um, my name is Joe Ferrodi, and I'm here today with Jason Cameron, the County Veterans Service Officer for both Monterey and San Benito counties. We're here today to share with you the importance of County Veterans Services. I'll cover the background and provide an overview of services, followed by a current status report and our future goals. Um, I'd like to briefly discuss some of the background mis misconceptions surrounding veteran services. Um, the first is that we just uh, fill out and file forms. Uh, at the most basic level, I can understand this misconception. Uh, our office processes over 250 standard VA forms as we work to connect veterans with the many benefits available to them. There is more to processing than simply filing the forms. Our advocacy for each veteran can last from about six months to 20 years or longer as we work to ensure veterans obtain the maximum benefit for which they are eligible. Another misconception, all veterans can use the VA for health care. Uh, the truth is that the VA has about eight priority groups for veterans depending on the details of their service and their disabilities. Our office works to make sure that veterans eligible for the highest priority group um, get into that group uh, to reduce their out-of-pocket expenses uh, for health care. You know, and as we're talking about the ambulance and the need and, and Medi-Cal and all of the insurance coverages, we can connect veterans with VA health insurance to help alleviate a lot of these costs for the veterans in the county. Some misconceptions are that we only help veterans with disabilities or accessing VA health care or that we only help veterans. Our office supports surviving spouses, dependents, and veterans seeking education, housing, and employment assistance. You don't have to have a disability to benefit from the services of our office. Uh, one of the other big misconceptions is one visit is all it takes. Uh, veteran services is a cradle to grave obligation. We support our veterans for their lifetime as well as the spouses and their, their children when they're born. Um, we see most of our veterans regularly as their need for benefits changes and usually increases over time. Uh, we know most of our veterans intimately and we are invested in their well-being. 
you know, our, our services are based on President Lincoln's promise uh, that those who have made the greatest sacrifices in service to their country deserve their country's service in return. And he also quoted, to care for him, and I'll add, or her, who shall have borne the battle, and for his or her widow and his or her orphan. Um, our responsibility to the veterans of San Benito County comes right out of the California Military and Veterans Code. The code allows for the partnership between San Benito and Monterey County to provide veteran services collectively. A good way to summarize the services is that we're here to administer aid, investigate claim, uh, and provide services. And those services would be to like the homeless veterans of the county, those veterans that are housing challenged, um, those veterans that are seeking educational assistance, and those veterans that are seeking health care assistance. The agreement to do these things, administer aid, investigate claims, and perform services collectively was established back in July of 2011. So this partnership has been in existence since 2011 and continues today. Um, our partnership establishes Jason Cameron as the County Veteran Service Officer. The position of County Veteran Service Officer, you're required to be a veteran, and you're responsible for the, the welfare and the morale of all of the veterans in your county. All 58 counties in the state of California have a County Veteran Service Officer, and Jason represents both of our counties. Um, we also have our Senior Service Representative, which is Sherry Stevenson. She provides full-time services to San Benito County veterans, and she's actually located just two doors down here. Jason and Sherry have access to the full support of our office, which includes myself, uh, five additional veteran service reps, two full-time clerical support staff, and we have several VA work-study students providing a, a support as well. Collectively, we ensure that San Benito County veterans and their families have the best support available to connect them with the many benefits for which they may be eligible. So what are those benefits? Uh, explaining them individually would take more time than we have this morning. Briefly, the benefits are aimed at enhancing the lives of veterans for their families in honor of their service to our county. Um, you can see the list of benefits here. Uh, we, we provide services for all of these benefits. Uh, the challenge is not the benefits that are available, it's the process. Up here is a flow chart that the VA generated depicting the standard claim process. So one claim for benefits, this is the process for which it flows through the VA. Um, it can be very confusing and very overwhelming uh, for veterans and for their families to apply for benefits. Therefore, veteran services are crucial to ensure that veterans are successful navigating claims for their benefits. Each veteran service rep is required to be accredited by the California Department of Veterans Affairs to know the rules and regulations in the 38 USCS and the 38 CFR. And just to give you guys an example of what that is, um, this book is the 38 USCS and the 38 CFR. Our veteran service reps are required to know this book and they're tested on it annually to make sure they keep up with the changes. So the question is, are we successful? And tired. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a status report of the roughly 5,500 veterans in San Benito County, and that number so undercuts the amount of folks that we're serving. That's 5,500 veterans in an older U.S. Census. Our services extended to the um, spouses and the dependents of those veterans is roughly three times the amount of individuals that are here to benefit from the services. 26% of them are connected with veterans' benefits, 26% of all of the veterans in the county. Um, this is higher than the state average of 24%, but lower than what we would like to see. The reason is, is that even at a 26% uh, percent engagement rate, benefit payments have exceeded $13 million in San Benito County alone. Each year, Veteran Services connects veterans with over $2 million in benefits. That's just one year of services provided in the office. The average award per claimant is life-changing for some. Uh, we have had homeless veterans that have received retroactive awards, um, $50,000 or greater, which allows them to obtain housing. Um, and that's also accompanied with monthly payments that allows them to cover their, their costs and expenses. And stories like that aren't rare for us, they're regular. Every month we're noticing the impact that we can have on veterans' lives. So as the CAO shared, we're, we're here to share with you basically our status report. This is an annual report generated from the services that we've provided here in San Benito County. Um, each of the supervisors have been provided a copy of this report, and there's plenty of copies in the back if anyone would like to leave um, with one. 
We are committed to building on this success year over year and providing the board our report every year around this time around Veterans Day. Um, and you can see from the port that over $2 million of um, claim income that's come into the, the veterans of, of the of San Benito County. Now the $2 million, it's tax-free income, but what it does is it frees up income for them to be able to do other things. Um, the benefits aside, the access to the VA health care is life-changing. Um, we've had folks with multiple sclerosis that have uh, faced that challenge their entire lives. Once we get them service-connected for that disability, the treatment, which can be um, can lead to bankruptcy for some, is available to them free of cost. Um, almost 1,000 claims filed, well over 1,300 veterans seen. The college tuition fee waiver, so any dependents of service-connected veterans, no matter how small the disability, are eligible to go to California-funded state colleges free tuition. That goes for anywhere from the community colleges to the state colleges to the UCs. We have dependents today going to UC Berkeley and UC Davis because of their parents' service without paying a single penny in tuition costs. We also bring back over $32,000 in sub subvention payments. This is um, the state's program to basically provide oversight to the services that we provide and to provide some um, compensation for the services. It's not much, but it offsets the costs of providing the program services. We're always at outreach events. We'll always have a table at any parade, um, not just to do with veterans. We're definitely trying to reach the dependents, and we're looking for opportunities to partner with the local high schools just to make sure those student uh, veterans have this information as well. To continue with our, st our status report, we are facing some current challenges that are impacting our goals. Uh, the first challenge is that in July of 2019, we were required to vacate our primary office location at the Veterans Memorial Building. Uh, there were some health concerns. We've temporarily relocated to 439 4th Street. Uh, thanks to the CAO and the county's support, we have an office to provide services out of, and we're truly appreciative of that. Um, and 439 4th Street is the one that's two doors down where Sherry's currently at. Uh, this temporary relocation has taken longer than we had anticipated uh, for the city to respond to the health concern in the Veterans Memorial Building. Uh, we're meeting with the assistant city manager to discuss uh, how soon we can be back in providing services at the Veterans Memorial Building. Um, those of you in San Benito County should know that having a beautiful building like the one that you have here is a rarity uh, and it's a um, anchor for veterans. It's the first place that a veteran's going to go um, when they realize like I need to find out more about my benefits. They're going to walk into that door and currently we're not behind that door and we'd like to be there for them and greet them. Uh, that 26% engagement rate, that's because veterans don't often get around to taking care of themselves. They're usually busy taking care of others, either their families or providing services to the community. That one day that they have the time to take care of their, themselves, we want to be there to receive them and connect them with the benefits. Um, we also have regular visits from the Santa Cruz Vet Center, a VA mobile treatment vehicle, uh, and HUD VASH. Those services have been impacted by this temporary relocation as well. Uh, it's difficult to provide those services in the area that we're currently in, and they're used, the veterans are used to accessing those services from the Vets Memorial Building. Uh, we go in hand in hand with those services that are provided because as they apply for access, we're filing their claim to ensure they have the eligibility. The future goals that we have here, um, as Jason mentioned, this might be the first time that our veteran service office has, has um, been here to present to the San Benito County Board of Supervisors and San Benito County as a whole. Uh, we have big plans for what we can do with, uh, to su provide support to veterans here. Um, they deal with our hardest to reach, our, our homeless veterans outreach. Uh, with one veteran service rep here in the area, we need to be behind that door, as I said. We also need to be out there with the veterans that can't get to the door um, to provide services to them on site. And so our goal is to make the commitment to the homeless veterans of this county. Uh, veterans that are housebound and on, on hospice that can't get out of their beds or out of their homes to come see us, we want to provide an opportunity to reach them and provide services to them as well. There, uh, the more rural areas in most counties are usually the most underserved, and we want to um, be able to provide services to those folks who for transportation limitations um, or the restricted access to information that comes with being rural, we want to make sure we're providing the, the information where they're available to receive it. The high school partnership, every 
month, I come across a veteran who just paid for four years of tuition that could have been free. Uh, and the challenge is, is the veterans are usually the last to be the ones that go to seek the resources. It's usually a spouse um, or a friend or hopefully a child that lets the veteran know there's benefits that the family can benefit from to honor your service. Um, and you should go in and find out about those. So we're looking to partnership um, with San Benito High School and, and to make sure that the, the student veteran, uh, the student dependents of veterans are aware of this opportunity. Uh, Monterey County has a wonderful veterans treatment court. Um, veterans uh, facing legal challenges in Monterey County do not go through the normal court system. They actually access a special court presided over um, by Judge Burleson, and they're partnered with a peer veteran mentor to help make sure that they meet their probation appointments, they go to the classes that have been assigned to them, and after about six months or 12 months of participation, um, most of their charges are dropped and they leave with a clean record. Um, this is a way for us to honor their service and to give back. Um, currently, beginning explorations are being done to see if San Benito can host something similar to the Veterans Treatment Courts that are popping up not only in Monterey County, but many counties throughout the state. And then transportation services to Palo Alto. Uh, many of you might not understand, Palo Alto is where the closest large VA facility is for veterans to receive treatment. Uh, it's, a, it's a big trip. Uh, gas prices aren't helping with the availability to get up there. Uh, we do provide van ride services in Monterey County, and a bus comes once a month to San Benito County to take veterans from here up to Palo Alto and back. Uh, that's very challenging for veterans who are trying to access those benefits because they have to schedule everything on that day of the month. And for many of you, a particular day of the month may not be the right, month, right day for you to take care of that. And so those are our future goals as we're, as we're leaning forward and trying to take uh, more opportunities to reach all of the veterans here and increase that engagement rate. And that concludes my presentation, and Jason and I are both here if there are any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supervisor Gillew. Uh, yeah, gentlemen, both, both, uh, both of you, thank you for your service, and thank you for what you're continuing to do here to serve our veterans' critical need in our community. And I'll personally say this, and I think uh, our board will probably agree with me, anything we can do as a group to help you, please don't hesitate to come to us, either through the CAO or directly. And then me personally, um, I'll give you my phone number um, and my contact, anything I can do to help our veterans. I'm um, humbled to be able to assist. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to echo Supervisor Gillio again. I, I, I thank you very much for your service and, and what you bring to San Rio County. This has been a real good partnership for uh, now a number of years with Monterey County. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, our county is, is small. Uh, it doesn't quite warrant uh, a full-time office, and, and this partnership works really well uh, for us. And, and you do a great job and we really do need to get you back to the the vets building as soon as possible thank you thank, thank you, you um <clears throat> i just want to say thank you two things one is i totally agree with supervisor Botello. we need to move you guys back to the vets that's where the organization belong <coughs> belongs it is it is the symbol it is a trademark of veteran services at that building and two you have a wonderful staff and sherry and her group helping out the community and i'm very proud that we have her on our side our too. absolutely thank you mr chair thank you um thank you to you gentlemen for your service uh, my my uh, support is obviously in consideration of of the truth the sacrifice you guys put forth uh, just even ser not only serving our veterans but ultimately be willing to serve yourselves so it's an honest reflection of, of your passion to, to look you know to love our country and uh, I just I try to remind my family every day that you know that we we need to consider our veterans um, every Veterans Day actually is is the day that we, we make sure that we go out there we go out there early and um, it's even just for the sake of recognition you know the reality that these things that our, our, our veterans when they come home they don't they don't just come home with a clean slate in their mind you know there's a lot of need that they have um, dealing with with the tough situation of battle so ultimately there's got to be a stronger support and I appreciate that you guys are willing to take this on thank you thank you sir thank you, thank you sir
Uh, number 23, I'd like to invite up uh, Dulce in regards to the uh, San Benito County strategic plan for 2019 through 24. Thank you, Chair. And, um, Ray, before we begin, do you want to say? I, I just wanted to say a few words, uh, Mr. Chair, board. Um, uh, we ventured on this journey about a year ago, November, October, November of last year. We started the process looking at what we were going to do uh, concerning a strategic plan for the county. Uh, we interviewed uh, quite a few uh, folks uh, that could assist us with that. We ended up moving forward with Angela and Antonon or Ant Antori, Antonori, excuse me, and um, and your board actually. Um, were an integral part of the process at the board retreat. So uh, it's definitely a, a team effort, but I wanted to emphasize to the board that um, we have here Edgar and Dulce that really kind of spearheaded this as of this year. And I commend them and on their all their hard work that they did to get the strategic plan where we're at today. Uh, facilitating and working with departments and department heads and and other stakeholders so I appreciate all your work fantastic job and I think there's a lot of great um, hooks that are tied to this that we're going to be able to benefit and use in the future with staff reports budgeting and other things which I'm sure they're going to elaborate on so thank you uh, I'll go ahead and pass this to Edgar I believe or or Dulce so this is a team effort. It is a collaborative between, I've never seen it personally, where it was cross-jurisdictional and involved the public and involved all of you guys. But most of all, um, we couldn't have done it with our our committee. And I just wanted to recognize and introduce all of them that are all here. We asked them here. So I just wanted to recognize them in front of you. And then if I could ask them if they could come in over here. Um, so, so you know who you are if you're on the committee. But Casey, Kelly, um, we have. Ashley. Um, Come on up, guys. I saw Angela. Yeah, so else? Uh, Gabe. <laughs> so in order for a strategic plan to be successful, it has to have commitment from everybody. And these people committed Warren. time, effort to make this happen. And Everything Stuart. you'll see here today is it comes from your leadership, your ideas, and then we put them into a strategic plan for the county, the betterment of the county. This is going to, like Ray said, this is going to have huge hooks going forward it's going to make us a better more efficient county going forward yeah and i just want to add um the steering committee um took the the report that was um provided by angela and we expanded on it we um together cohesively um cross departmental um created a vision mission uh, our core values and we made them applicable to various departments throughout the county um which which makes it applicable to the entire county so i don't know if you guys want to share any any so thoughts or any quick words <laughs> no <laughs> so um, we picked members that were from different departments different <laughs> departments have different aspects our probation department our elections Oh, sorry. Mike. <laughs> um, different departments that incorporate all of our county services. For instance, behavioral health is a huge department. Casey having his huge breadth in health and human services, probation, sheriff's office, safety. Safety is a big element, and we heard a lot of safety issues coming up through the strategic plan process. So we try to incorporate all aspects of the department to get a full understanding and a full breadth when it comes to a strategic plan. And also, um, we had department head level. Um, participation and I know um, a big thank you to our budget director Stuart Patrick because he helped a lot he's not up here but he helped more run the fiscal side of things for this yeah and we want to acknowledge Lauren too she's been instrumental in, in this as well and then all the department heads for allowing your staff to spend countless hours on on picking the right words that represent us in our county so um, thank you for for your leadership skills and um, and supporting your team to, to get to where we are today. So, yeah, so thank you guys. You guys want to stand up here? You guys are more than welcome. Through the PowerPoint. Okay. So we're, we're just going to, we, I created a brief presentation to go over the strategic plan. Um, so the value of a strategic plan um, 
strategic planning is about influencing the future rather than simply adapting to it. And it's important that we have a framework where we where we prioritize where we're going to spend our time, energy, and resources going forward. Um, we establish a, com a unified commitment and um, work towards united goals. And so, yeah. as you see, as a, as a county, we're a smaller county. We have less resources than anybody else. We have to do partnerships, come up with creative ideas, and think outside of the box. So, this is one way for your board to come up with ideas that you really want us to focus. And then our CAO is saying putting directive and then this coming up with a strategic plan, a plan moving forward on how to best do services here in the county. Okay, so kind of a step back of, of where how we started and got here. Um, Ray mentioned our, our board retreat and strategic plan workshop. Um, Noel, or Noe, sorry. Man. I just want, we want to acknowledge Noe, thank you for the pictures. Um, um, he, he was taking pictures during our board retreat, and these are some of the pictures that we captured while we were deep in thought during this process. <laughs> and uh, he provided them to us, so thank you, uh, from Bonita Link. Um, but so the, the board retreat was on um, February 2019. Um, the facilitator was Angela, which is on, on the left screen. Um, the workshop included doing an external external scan where we evaluated trends, demands um, of our region, and we looked at the th last three to five years of where our county had been. Um, we also discussed the desirable future. If we continued um, the desirable future we envision, as well as the probable future if we didn't change anything. And um, so that was discussed during the, during the board retreat. In addition, there was a SWOT analysis where we looked at strengths, weaknesses, opportunity, and threats uh, that our county faced. And um, from that, th we discussed proposed goals for consideration, which um, the team behind me expanded on and um, put forward in the strategic plan. In addition, I, I think Edgar touched base on um, the Angela, who's worked with many jurisdiction. This was her first experience of working cross-jurisdictional with um, so as part of the, the strategic um, planning process, we invited our, our communities, our um, San Juan Batista and um, Hollister leaders to also attend and um, provide their input. And, and um, that shows great collaborative leadership from um, coming from all. Okay. So as a strategic <coughs> plan, we came up with our mission and vision, and I just wanted to read it out to you, get to your board. San Benito County is a community that provides collaborative and affordable public services through diversity, innovation, and transparency. Short, sweet, really hard to come up with and show <laughs> the message of our county. I think our we, group we struggled <laughs> so much to pick the appropriate words that really describe this county. And again, I can't thank them enough um, for their input and their ideas because this is one of the easiest things to really come up with, but one of the hardest because picking the right words, making it sound good and getting to the point. Um, same thing with our mission, to adopt policies that reflect the goals and priorities of the community, designing network of services that prioritizes public safety, equality, economic vibrancy, while balancing commitments of to, to the region's rich history <laughs> and preposterous future. So, so w one thing, so our vision represents where we see the future and our mission is the why, why we do what we do. Um, and, I, and I think the team did a great job um, capturing that um, here as, as best as we. <laughs> oh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think we better trademark uh, both the vision <laughs> and mission statements. It's very good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so. <coughs> So values, so these are our, our core values, support our vision, they help shape the culture, um, they're the philosophy of our values and um, cohesively the, the team came up with uh, these nine values and... Um, so some of the things that we were going through the strategic plan, if you guys recall, there was, a, there was words to describe what a strategic plan is um, and throughout there was a consensus of, of words and those words were then brought back to the steering committee which these are the n the values that m best represent our county and what we're doing and then drill those down into and how to as a county address those 
those values and these are the focus areas that we came up with. Also coming up with a visual aid, um, like our CAO Spinoza said, we're gonna go, this is not gonna sit on a shelf, we're gonna go move forward, implement this. And so we came up with visual aids on how to represent these focus areas that pertain to the values. Yeah, um, so I just wanna, why don't you guys wanna just read out our values so it's not just me and Matthew. Doing good. Doing great. <laughs> we got you back. They were more participants <laughs> during the process. Yes, I, they I were promise. very involved in that. Um, so our values are community, collaboration, equality, transparency, respect, innovation, integrity, serve and protect, and accountability. Um, and then there are five focus areas derived from our plan, and they include uh, uh, operational develop development excellence, uh, planning for sustainable growth, technology, community engagement, and uh, healthy and safe community. So there's five areas um, that we <coughs> focused on. All right, so going, going through our focus areas, um, the, the committee made a goal for each area that, um, that expanded. So for example, operational development development excellence, we focus on staffing, customer service, organizational leadership, organizational culture. As a, as a group, is we came up, we were challenging ourselves, how do we get to that focus area? How do we get there? And these are some of the, the things that we can do as a county to get to those specific focus areas. Like two, um, planning sustainable growth. How do we get there? Some of the things that we heard during the strategic plan economy, housing, infrastructure, environment, and these are all really important to the county, but these are how we're gonna, ideas on how to get to, um, that are the focus areas. Um, then we have technology, which we have, um, there's an aspect that's external to the community and we have internal to the, to the county, um, also innovation and security. Uh, community engagement, um, again, cross jurisdictional relationships. I think we focused that on that and we're building upon that. I think I, I say that here that I've never seen in other jurisdictions where there's so collaborative cross jurisdictional health. And I think that's unique and that's the beauty of San Benito County. Um, communication across all levels uh, and public private partnerships, thinking inside of the box, seeing how we can do best with more with less. So with healthy and safe communities, there was four areas we focused on, and there's um, promote healthy choices, local jurisdictions, um, community support, and recreational leadership. And so each, each one of these areas has a goal that's in the strategic plan, and it's very easy to follow. Um, I don't want to read each goal in front of you, but it, it is in the report. Um, and then crafting the goals using the right word was also um, we, we spend a lot of time focusing on the details and um, scratching things, going back to the drawing boards, and um, it was a very thoughtful process to, to draft each goal and, and, um, and getting there. Okay, so the next steps would be, how are we gonna use this plan into our operations? So um, we plan to implement the strategic plan into the budget cycle, so relating the budget to how it's meeting one of the five particular goals, um, and as well as in the agenda. Do you want to add to? Um, okay. And and then we, um, in addition to that, we want to develop actionable steps to achieving uh, the goals outlined in the focus area with working within each department. So this is something that we should be really proud of putting together. It shows that are working collaboratively, how we can do things better. But most than anything, we're, we're gonna come back to your board with ideas of how to implement this going forward. It's not just gonna sit in a shelf. Some of the ideas is bringing it back with our, with our new uh, budgeting process, GovInvest, uh, with our budget director, see how we can implement, how certain budgets you know, f help with the focus areas, uh, board agendas, how you know, put an icon and say, if we bring an item to your board, it hits this focus and that focus, not only just for us, but for members of the public and can really see how we're putting the strategic plan going forward. And also really sell our wins. I don't think as government we sell our wins. They don't, the public doesn't see all the hard work that we do putting things forward and showing members of the public, this is our win. This is how we, we're doing more with less. 
Um, so, so with this um, strategic plan, there is a, a resolution, um, which by adopting the resolution, this <coughs> becomes our formal um, countywide strategic plan. So. Um, that staff recommendation and once again thank you board for being part of the process and, and staff and department heads and um, our CAO really for for leading this and being instrumental so um, thank you all and uh, open yeah. up for questions Supervisor Botello okay um, thank you it's a very good report uh, and I'm enthusiastic about it especially the focus areas now you, and you were mentioning just a second ago, you know, the implementation of the uh, of this plan into the the budget cycle. And so how are we going to keep updating this as far as seeing progress? I think there's a lot of things that uh, you're already doing, all the departments are doing as far as, you know, focusing on customer service and improving, you know, staffing levels and things like that. Uh, so how, how does that come back? To making sure we're we are do, uh, achieving progress with the plan. So, Supervisor, that is a great idea. So, we would implement this going forward and bring it back during our strategic plan meeting, or our our retreat. And then, how do we refocus things? If it's the wish of your board to move in another direction, or you know, fine tune things, that's when the it would be done at that process. Then it gives staff direction on how to move forward with those areas. So we would have a segment in our retreat each year and probably updates later on in Correct, the year. Yeah. Okay, got it. And then I, I feel like le we can actually implement <coughs> matrixes down the line. Um, we're not there yet, but it's something we we aspire to. We, we've talked about at an administration. Um, so I think matrix, like baselining where we are and where we want to be, um, would, would be long-term goal. Um, and that's a that's how you would report out how, how well you're doing on certain mm -hmm. areas. And Mr. Mr. Chair, if I may just add one comment to that. One of the things that we've been working on administratively is, and one of the key points here is the focus areas and actually having those little tabs, if you can go to it, um, it's just uh, the actual icons. One of the things that we've been talking about is having something, just a quick view that you could see during the budget process or if there is a, a staff report or something that relates to this, at least for the, the onset for the first year or two, these are just quick reminders that these are related to or, or aligned with the strategic plan. And I think that'll help, but I think what uh, Dulce had said and what we've been working on internally is how are we gonna quantify that, how we're gonna actually really uh, deliver a, a matrix, a full-blown matrix, that's something we still need to work on and develop, but um, at least this is a, a good starting point for this uh, first few years here. I use an example of an item came to your board, um, say it was probation, and Chief Rantella was here presenting, he can hit certain focus areas as a visual aid for everybody, um, depending on the item, and that's where we're trying to get all flavors of our department through our committee, steering committee, so they can, when items are presented before your board, um, we're able to address focus areas as that item. Mm. Sure. Uh, just a couple comments. Thank you, uh, the whole group and the administrative team and Stuart and uh, the folks who didn't want to stand up there. That, I really appreciate all your hard work on this. The, you guys all worked really um, diligently to get this together, and it's very professional, easy to read, um, quick. I've, I've been a part of and seen a lot of these plans over the years, and they a lot of times get shelved. You know, we, we did all the good work, and, you know, you throw it on the shelf and kind of forget about it. I really like your thoughts and your ideas about incorporating this into um, all of our daily activities and especially using icons to say, hey, this hits this area. You know, you can have a, um, a book of rules and regulations that's, you know, 500 pages long, but the bottom line, if we're behaving and um, seeking to achieve these goals on this list and we're going about it in a fair and equitable way this is what should guide our principles that now that our entire team is bought into it and hopefully the board uh, buys into it by our vote here today and i really want to just see this used and you're probably going to hear me refer to it a lot and you'll probably get tired of hearing me refer to it but uh, i just wanted to um, let you know that I, I really appreciate that you know leveraging uh, public private partnerships is, is, is critical for a county that is lacking in resources we've heard today probably uh you know 
I'm being hyper hyperbolic a little bit here, but you know, a dozen times how we don't have the resources to do different things we want to do. And you know, focus area four has got to be critical. We need to really uh, work on that. And again, um, just thank you, um, uh, CAO Espinosa, and everybody who uh, worked on this. I really do appreciate this, and I think it's a great document. Al Cruz, anything? No, <clears throat> I I look at a lot of these f boxes and and it's like these are things that we have discussed and you guys kind of put them in a nice format that it's easy and readable to use at any other mission cause that that we might en endeavor down down the road and which I really do enjoy and, and Supervisor Gilly to talk about you know private public partnerships is actually very important. Supervisor uh, Hernandez and myself are working on a sports complex that, at the end of the day, will require some type of some type of public, public and private funding to, in order to, to to be successful. So you actually developed the, the model and the pathway and how to do it. So thank you. Yeah, and and to that, um, I can't thank our committee enough. Um, I want to say thank you, committee. They in drafting um, each goal. Um, throwing it out, scratching it, and, and, and really being, being thoughtful of, of how do we represent everybody and how do we make this equitable and um, how is this really something that, that is inclusive and, and um, oh, there's a public-private <laughs> partnership. Um, yeah, so, so thank you, committee, for, for really scrutinizing it and going through it and um, making the goals applicable. Peter? Yeah. Mr. Chair, thank you. So thank you, team. <laughs> thank you, Dulce. Thank you, Edgar, for all that you guys did. It's funny because I'm, as I read and reflect on I was reading it yesterday, and I thought, man, this is really good because ultimately it creates a focus, right? You, it was mentioned earlier, limited resources. Um, I mean, kind of the, it, it, in the mindset, I guess, of my, my mind as far as a business plan, this is kind of the reality is, is you can't really know what you you know what, what you want to do with your business, how you want to grow it, all that is irrelevant until you actually understand who you're serving, and and then follow through with why you're serving them. So, and then it creates a focus. So in that sense, it it's it, you start with with the the who and the why, and then you get to answering those questions through your processes, and the, you know ultimately it anchors the reality of your resolutions and your policies and it gives a lot more life to them because it makes it consistent. But I would say the biggest thing, well, two things that stand out to me is, one is um, it definitely requires buy-in, which I, I, I completely agree with the plan in the sense that cross-jurisdictional relationships, especially with limited resources, it's really hard to get one thing done when you, you have two agencies doing kind of the same thing and really could be working together to solve the same goal. And then uh, the second thing that stands out is, um, which is just, in, in my opinion, it's, it should be and it sounds like it will be very objective instead of subjective because then you can get veer off track and you lose focus right it's very easy to get into you know uh, opinions that are hard to anchor with with reality of uh, so i see the objectivity in it and i totally support it and i believe it has a strong foundation so now hopefully the house that gets built from that foundation becomes a really solid house uh, with a, because of a solid foundation and this is definitely the start of it so thank you any uh, public comment <laughs> Good morning. Leslie Austin with Aromas. I'm a resident. Um, I want to start by saying that I've been involved in a number of strategic planning processes and I know how complicated they are. And um, um, the spirit of my question today really has more to do with um, understanding communication within the community and getting a clear understanding of, of what's being proposed. The first thing I noticed in the mission, there's a section about goals and priorities of the community, and I guess my first question would be um, to talk a little bit, if you could, about how the community was a part of the st strategic planning process, and if those folks are here and can be recognized. The second thing I want to note is that in the values, we talk about equality, but equality and equity are not the same. And I would love for, um, for the values to include equity as a part of, of the planning. And then the, in the third 
um, area. We talk about focus areas, specifically focus on sustainable growth, which as a member of or, or an employee of Green Power, a nonprofit in Santa Cruz, I'm extremely happy to see. And um, we also talk about uh, communication as a focus area. I'm going to take a quick look at that slide. Um, community engagement and communication, and I think I saw in another slide just this last one that was up. An exchange of, oh, thank you. An exchange, uh, so communication exchange, complete, accurate, and timely information with the entire community through open channels of communication. Um, I know that this is an exceptionally complicated thing to do. Um, especially with a busy public, a distracted public, but it would be helpful for me to understand a little bit about what is intended here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll hit on the first one, communication. Um, we, as an administration and as your board's directive, we've already started building on communication. One of the biggest things that we're doing is GovInvest. We're one of the first counties in the state to be completely transparent, completely digital on our budgeting process, which is probably the most important thing for a government agency. Second, we're revamping our website. Lauren's taking lead on that. She's making our, our most important and probably the most easiest way for members of the public to communicate with us is through our website. Also, we started um, hitting social media. Um, Lauren's leading that effort also. We are active in Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook as of right now. Um, before that, um, we didn't have any social media presence, so now we are. Um, we try to put out there on social media anything that um, to communicate with the members of the public. Um, and, uh, and kind of to add on to GovInvest, um, they have a portal where we can do surveys to the public through through GovInvest, which could be put on our, our website. Um, is it GovInvest? Yeah, it's GovInvest. Um, um, there was a question about community. Um, as the strategic plan was part of our uh, retreat that we had. The members of the public were um, present. I don't see, um, actually, our council member for the Juan Bautista was there, um, and other members of the public. I, don't have names or would be able to recognize them, but the public was much involved with this. And I, I in the, in our initial process um, th through the board retreat, so. Well, thank you very much. Uh, bring it back to the board. What's the wish of the board? Mr. Chair, um, I think we need a motion on this to uh, adopt and approve the um, strategic plan, and I'm prepared to make that motion now. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. Takes us to uh, number 24. This is also, I believe, uh, Dulce, dealing with um, the presentation uh, of all the bills from 2019 and 2020. Actually, it's going to be Lauren. Lauren, okay. Lauren, Lauren Hall, you, Lauren. and we're going to have Jamela here. The, um, I've asked Lauren and Jamela to put together a presentation concerning uh, the um, Le new uh, the legislative bills that um, have been uh, passed at the state and to give the your board an update and uh, which which ones really have an impact with our county and um, I think there's one that's really four is the is the housing element so I think Jamel is going to go ahead and cover that in the in the uh, beginning of the presentation but Lauren's going to have a tag team with her and have some other items as well to discuss so uh, perfect. So, uh, like the CAO mentioned, um, my name is Jamila, and I am the Housing Programs Coordinator for both the City of Hollister and uh, San, uh, San Benito County. Good morning. I'm Lauren. I'm a Management Analyst here um, in the Admin Office. So just to start off with, uh, we'd like to indicate that currently right now uh, the legislation is on a recess. Um, all the bills that we are going to be presenting today um, did have to be reviewed uh, by the deadline of October 13th, 2019. And that was the last date that the governor could either sign or veto bills. And most bills that we're going to present today are going to take an effect uh, January 1st, 2020. 
So uh, one of the biggest bills is SB 330. That makes some of um, the biggest changes in terms of housing production. Um, there are some provisions in the bill that have certain exceptions to them. So this is just kind of a, a quick overview of um, the different provisions um, in the bill. Um, as far as applications, um, it places restrictions on application approvals. Um, so it prohibits local agencies from disapproving um, development projects um, unless it makes certain findings that are spelled out um, in the bill. Um, as far as preliminary applications go, it limits the ability of um, local jurisdictions to change um, the development standards um, once an application has been submitted. So anything that's um, in effect at the time of the application is what that has to be judged on. And then lastly, when it comes to applications, uh, the county only has one chance to identify incomplete items, and after that, it can't request any further information from the applicant. Uh, it also places restrictions on fees that can be charged. Um, so it has to, any fee that's in place at the time of the application has to be what is charged. There can't be a change um, in the middle of that process. It limits the number of hearings that can be held to five, including planning commission and board hearings. Um, and just in general, um, it, it enacts um, certain provisions to ensure that housing production um, is kind of streamlined. Um, so it prohibits the inaction of policies um, that would lessen um, the intensity of housing that is zoned in certain areas. And then lastly, um, as far as the timeline goes for approving applications, um, for most projects, it reduces um, the timeline from 120 days to 90 days um, to when the county has to make a determination on the project. Um, but for projects that meet certain affordability requirements, that timeline is even further reduced um, from 90 days to 60 days. And then further discussing uh, the preliminary, preliminary applications, currently right now as written, uh, the SB 330 prohibits a county, um, including through voter and active enacted uh, initiatives or referendums from enacting an, a policy or standard or condition that would change the zoning designation to be less intensive, kind of like stated a moment ago, so basically having uh, maybe potentially less units. Um, it would prohibit an, uh, a moratorium on housing development prohibit um, new subjective design standards established on or after January 1st, 2020. And uh, it would also prohibit certain limits on the number of permits issued or the number of units approved um, unless there was an, a previous approval prior to January 1st, 2005 in a predominantly agricultural county. Um, so uh, this would basically kind of be what we have discussed as a growth management ordinance. Um, previously, as stated as well, when it comes to applications, um, it's important to note that um, further or future applicants will have to be given a full application with all information. So we cannot change things, and if they provide an application, we cannot tell them they're incomplete for these reasons if it was not listed on the application. So it's really important for our uh, department to make sure we have an updated project application that's available both to the public um, in the office and available online as well. Uh, with this bill, many of the provisions do sunset and do end in 2025, um, but also as written is there are fines that are implemented in this uh, Senate bill if things are not being followed. So for instance, if a county or jurisdiction does not follow through and follow the guidelines, uh, we could be potentially fined $10,000 per unit that was going to be um, on the application. And lastly, if a project does not start construction within two and a half years of the final approval, or if it's modified to include 20% or more units, um, the project could then be subjected to new standards and may not have to follow all of them that are written in SB 330. Shifting gears a little bit, um, there were major changes to um, 
the accessory dwelling unit ordinances or laws at this time. Uh, many were created to provide incentives and streamline the process for those who want to apply for accessory dwelling unit. Um, for the first part is that it can be ministerially approved or denied within 60 days. So that, that basically means that it can be reviewed in-house by staff and it does have to be reviewed within 60 days, does not have to go to a public meeting or be publicly noticed. And if uh, staff does not communicate within 60 days, that uh, project or that application then is approved. Um, a jurisdiction cannot limit the amount or the minimum lot size that an accessory dwelling unit can be added to a property and it has changed the setbacks. Um, so it kind of lessens the amount of setbacks from where the accessory unit can be placed. Uh, most importantly as well, um, for at this time period, there are no impact fees for accessory dwelling units that are 750 square feet or less, um, and it does reduce it to t only 25% if it's more than 750 square feet. And I forgot to mention, all the bills in bold are all the ones related to accessory dwelling units, and I will kind of briefly explain um, specific points of each of them. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, yeah. uh, put a... Uh, have a question right there while we switch sides. Um, how compatible is our current housing element with the new laws that are being passed? Uh, is there a lot more work that we're have to bring uh, to clarify uh, our current local laws with the new state laws? That's a really great question. Um, our housing our element does not um, greatly specify accessory dwelling units as much as the state is putting um, focus on it. Um, but one thing that I was going to mention at the end of the presentation is um, we will be using, um, well, once we confirm, uh, we did submit our application for our SB2 grant, um, which is $160,000. So that money would go towards updating all these ordinances and updating it so that it matches state legislation. Um, so that's part of what the money will be used for. So perfect question um, that at least our ordinances will soon match what the state legislation meets. The housing element, um, we will be in the process in a couple of years of updating at that time. So it may not necessarily totally drive, but at least our ordinances will match what the state is requesting. Okay, and then second question, follow up. Uh, to me, this seems like a lot of changes. Uh, it's pretty complex changes are, between our planning staff and our consulting uh, help that comes in to help our, our staff. How are they able to keep up with all, all these new changes that will be implemented in just a couple of months? Uh, that's a very great question too. Um, I just planned on having staff meetings internally and um, as myself, one we've presented here to the Board of Supervisors. The goal is to present to Planning Commission and then just constantly meet. We do have weekly staff meetings as a planning department. Um, so this will be a great way to introduce this, but also make sure that um, most importantly, the public knows as well, but that our staff knows. So weekly staff meetings will probably be the best form. Um, and then additionally, with our SB2 funding, um, we can be able to hire a consultant to do all the updates for us. So that wouldn't necessarily be pulling staff time. Um, it would just take staff time now to review and re-understand the ordinances. Well, with that said, then how do we recoup the, that cost? And, you know, unfortunately, I think that's just part of doing our business here in staff is training. It is part of our ability to um, retrain ourselves in which legislation, but we can't necessarily charge the state our staff time. Uh, with the SB2 funding, part of it can be used for staff administration. Um, so that's part of that could be charged to the grant as well, um, just a maximum of 5%. Of so it's about $8,000 um, in terms of staff time and staff okay. Uh, needs. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. <coughs> Uh, the, these um, uh, SB 330 and SB 2 and all the other ones, they're all mandated and they're all, we're all required, every single county in the state of California is required to do it. Is that yes. correct? There's no exceptions? There's no waivers? Not at this time. Um, particularly, uh, the state has indicated that they will, um, by June 30th of 2020 have a complete exhaustive list of anyone that may meet an exception, particularly regarding SB 330. Um, but at this time, every single jurisdiction within the state has to abide by these new uh, laws effective January 1st, 2020. 
Okay. Um, there are ways, and if there is a jurisdiction that does meet an exception, the state does have to review and approve any ordinances. So there will be a communication between uh, the county and the State Housing and Community Development, or HCD, that they will ultimately have to approve any ordinances that are related to SB 330, particularly. Okay. Okay. Uh, moving on uh, with uh, further information about accessory dwelling units, um, this is also an interesting um, note is that if there is a area zoned single family residence, obviously now they can add the accessory dwelling unit, but they can also add what's called a junior accessory dwelling unit. And so it's basically attached to your home. Um, it doesn't necessarily have kitchen services, but it is another unit. Um, so it's important to note that now a home could technically have two additional pieces to it. Um, and then the other parts are kind of regarding um, individuals that may want to convert their garage to um, be able to have an accessory unit. There isn't replacement for parking. And um, also big to note is that homeowners associations can no longer limit individuals that want to add an accessory dwelling unit. So that cannot be something that can be put in the CCNR. That is an exception now is that they can be able to add in, uh, that information and can be rented. Uh. Um, next, specifically with AB 68, um, just kind of a brief overview is that this is an item that does indicate that um, accessory dwelling units do need to be approved or reviewed within 60 days and can be approved with um, staff review. Um, it does prohibit minimum lot size just as long as they're meeting those setbacks um, and they don't necessarily have to always be replacing parking. Um, and then that third point, um, the triplex action basically is that idea of having an ADU on your property plus that junior ADU, which is attached on the setbacks really quick is that per our county code or is there a new setback that this establishes so yeah exactly this will establish new setback and what, what are those do you have those or can four, we get those four, four feet, feet? Mm -hmm. okay yes. and we're at what seven now <laughs> I, i'm blanking on the county sorry I okay that's, that's okay thanks but um but somewhere around there so at this point now that will also be included in our update to our um, accessory dwelling unit ordinances with our sb2 grant that will all be incorporated and then next, uh, the okay, Mr. Chair, can yeah. you go back to number six? I'm sorry, number seven. Screen seven. Sorry, I don't have it. In, I don't know uh, the numbers in front of me. see uh, what was the title? unit. Where at the bottom says units can be rented. Yes. Um, at the affordable housing committee with that Chairman um, Medina and myself serve on, we discussed some ideas. So. Does the state of California supersedes uh, San Benito County rules? With, on this? with these ordinances, yes. So if we said that you could only rent it to a family member, that will that will be I illegal. No, um, this just means that it opens up the fact that if an individual does have an accessory dwelling unit, that it can be rented. A lot of times, there has been uh, written ordinances that it has to be owner occupied, or that the owner has to be the one using it. But now they're indicating that you can actually have someone separate from family or a family be okay. a part of that situation. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you. Um, AB 881 just indicates basically that when a new single family dwelling unit is being built, um, that if there is an accessory dwelling unit on the property, it's not considered a new unit for um, charging purposes. Um, so at times now, when people are previously building, they can consider that a new unit and charge different um, or additional fees when it comes to different um, hookups regarding water and um, sewer and things like that. Um, SB uh, 13, Owner Occupancy uh, Provisions and Fee Limitations. Um, again, this is a little bit repetitive, but just as a reminder that it prohibits minimum lot sizes for accessory dwelling units, um, and it, there isn't, doesn't necessarily have to be replacement parking. Um, AB 587, uh, 587 um, basically indicates that um, if meeting certain requirements, particularly if a nonprofit owns a piece of land, that they can be able to sell uh, um, the separate ADU units. Um, and this could mean that there could be a multifamily unit, an accessory unit on the property, and then the accessory unit could also be sold. But this is only for nonprofit? Nonprofits are one of the exceptions, yes. Um, that's the only one of the only that's exceptions. That's the only exception, so. 
pretty much, yes. So a wife's birthday can open up a nonprofit and... Oh, no. <laughs> but potentially, I didn't think about that, um, but potentially. I'm just, you know, playing devil's advocate. Yeah, I didn't think about it like that. <laughs> yeah, good question, actually. <laughs> Um, and Mr. Then, Chair, yes, sir. Oh, uh, yes. So, what's the potential with with the effect of the rental market? I mean, I know there's I, a rental. I think the state sees it as an, a potential increase, so that individuals who do have accessory current accessory dwelling units or want to add accessory units, that would increase the number of rentals or potential rentals within a jurisdiction. But did they put any consideration to bond impacts and like? Basically, you know, actually the question came up at the library meeting we just had, the feasibility study, um, you know, how to how to pay for things, right? Bonds seems to be the popular thing. And, uh, um, you know, then the question was, well, how, how do you know that it's going to be popular? Because if, if there's an increase in bonding and then a property owner, which, you know, if he rents his property, he or she, then they're going to end up having to um, charge more. But then if there's a rental cap, what is that going to do to the market? And then what, how is this going to, how is this going to impact that? That might, I might need to kind of take a moment to, to answer that. Um, and I'm not honestly quite sure. Um, I might need to kind of I mean, in take essence, a few moments and respond yeah. at a later time because that does kind of bring in various aspects that I'm not, that I might need a moment to think about. Um, but I, I think the, the ultimate goal is just to provide variety because the majority of the time it has been single family homes that have been developed um, where this could open up a variety of rentals and potentially with the increase in supply, potentially decrease the amount that would be charged over time. I mean, is there a measurement for even, well, that's a separate question, but just in general, I just, it makes me question bonding capacity for communities and I'm not a supporter of bonds in general, but this is still an issue. Yeah, let me, if it's okay, if I can get back to you with that, um, that might take me um, more time to think that I that I might need right now during the presentation. Thank you. That's okay. Actually, Mr. Chair, uh, Peter Hernandez does, did bring up an interesting question, and that is that you're trying to create a different type of housing unit, and, and I get that, um, but, but the $64,000 question or the elephant in the room isn't what the price is going to be because well, it's the assumption that these are going to be low-income rentals, but I could almost tell you it's what the market bears. Most likely, yes. It would be chosen by the homeowner. Yeah, and I've seen garages. I've seen uh, sofas rent for six, dollars $7,000. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> uh, trust me, I've seen them out there. So you know, this is something that the uh, uh, Affordable Housing Committee, sh we should talk down the road. Yeah, the problem we have is this supersedes everything. That's the issue we're having right now. And, and I guess I'll, this, is a, this is a good opportunity for, for me to say my, my famous comment, and, and that is that the state of California is no friend of San Benito County, and this is a perfect example right here. Well, as staff, I will try my best to make sure that we're, <laughs> we're balancing both. Um, Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> And then uh, lastly, sorry, was AB 671, um, which basically indicates that um, it will be the responsibility of the Housing Community Development Agency, HCD, to um, inform jurisdictions of different incentives and uh, potential grants to help um, incentivize and build accessory dwelling units. So they will have a year um, to confirm the information and send that to us. So that one is specific to that agency that they will have to provide the information. And then next we're gonna be talking about streamlining and some of the bills that Lauren had reviewed as well. Mm. Okay, so um, two bills, AB 1783 and AB 101 um, create CEQA exempt processes um, for farm worker housing in the case of 1783 and for navigation centers um, that serve homeless individuals in the case of AB 101. Um, AB 1483 imposes uh, requirements that local agencies make certain information available on their website. Um, so that includes a schedule of the current fees and affordability requirements that are applicable to um, housing development projects. It includes zoning ordinances and development standards, annual fee reports or financial reports, 
and um, impact fee studies and things like that. So all of those things have to be available on our website per AB 1483. Um, there's also some density bonuses um, used to encourage housing production. Um, AB 1763 um, allows for an 80% increase in density um, for affordable housing projects. And if that project is located within a half a mile of a major transit stop, it allows for unlimited increases in density to try to um, increase the housing production. And AB 1743 um, expands properties that are exempt from CFD taxes um, to include those that qualify for the property tax welfare exemption. Um, and it limits our ability to um, deny certain housing projects because they would qualify for that exemption. Uh, there's also a couple of bills related to the surplus land that local jurisdic jurisdictions own. Um, AB 1486 would require um, that we submit um, information about our surplus land to the State Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, so we have to have an inventory of our publicly owned um, sites available and submitted to the state. Um, SB 6 um, would require that same thing for anyone who prepares a housing element after January 1st, 2021 um, to create a list of land that's suitable for residential development that will also be submitted to um, HCD at the state um, to include in an online database. And then lastly, AB 1255 um, requires local jurisdictions to um, submit an inventory of its surplus lands that is located in urbanized area clusters. So it's specifically defined in the bill what um, meets that requirement. So the AB uh, 1486, who takes care of that internally here? That'll probably be us, uh, probably be administration. We'll make sure we'll work with RMA on that because- That will be due the 1st of January, I take it, so? this most of these as brought out in the presentation start in january okay. 2020 so yeah we don't have a whole lot we know we have a, we have some we just purchased one um i know we have the anzar property and um there, there's a few other properties that we have but yeah we'll make sure that happens can you send that list to us when yeah. you have it thank you yeah. And the next Sorry about that, Laura. Oh, no, that's a perfect question. Um, and the next question isn't necessarily truly related to uh, county administration or different um, agencies, but I just thought it was really important to know um, to the community and to the public of different pro tenant protection laws that will be taken in effect. Um, so the first one is AB 1482, and it indicates that uh, with rentals um, that there is a cap of 5% uh, plus inflation per year on a rental increase. Um, if the rental unit does vacate, um, the uh, cap doesn't necessarily stand. It can go back to market rate. Um, additionally, a landlord must indicate to the tenant um, pr and provide reasons for the eviction or for any eviction and provide relocation assistance. Um, this does not apply to homes built within 15 years or single family homes unless owned by a nonprofit. I um, just want <laughs> people to, to be aware so of the changes. And then uh, <laughs> lastly, in regards to housing is SB 329, <laughs> and it prohibits a landlord from discriminating against any tenants who do have or rely on Section 8 vouchers or other housing assistance paid directly to them. Um, so this will allow individuals to provide uh, vouchers to different renters. So that's just the uh, 329. Now I know that's Section 8, but um, so are we saying that landlords are rec not required but they have to they just cannot discriminate against someone now that has the voucher um at times there has been statements made that it's difficult to receive um the funding from the agency timely or things like that but that cannot be your basis for not choosing a, a tenant wow does um <laughs> if someone has a if someone has a voucher and they're looking for housing yeah would, would they be protected from a potential um, relationship with a landlord? Sorry, do you mind repeating that again? Sure. If I have if I have voucher eight and I'm looking for rent, would mm -hmm. I would they use that against me? 
they can now, they cannot. They, they cannot, cannot discriminate with this. against you. You can go to any rental. It does not have to be one um, that says Section 8 only. It can be any rental. Jamila, if you know off the top of your head on the uh, first, on 1482, rents, rents reset to market rate at vacancy, vacancy what, what is, how do we determine what a market rate is? Is it an average of all the rentals in the county? Do you look at Craigslist? Well, how does the owner know that? You know what, and, and that's a good question. I don't know from the okay. top of my head if, if they give specifics, but I will if it indicates um, if they have specific standards. I, I don't think so. I think it's just been at the will of the, the landlord or the owner of what they decided. Um, but let me, I'll confirm for you. Thank you. And it's only single family homes, right? It's not, not apartments. Um, so it can, does not apply to um, homes that have been built within 15 years or single family homes. So it really applies to apartments. Yeah, or my multifamily units or, or things. homes that are over 15 years. Over 15. Years. Yeah. Okay. Now and the then Lauren will finish this off with some that are varied. <laughs> so switching gears out of housing, um, there are quite a bit of other bills in other areas um, that are affecting counties. Um, as emergency services go, um, there were two bills that um, implement certain requirements for when um, we're preparing emergency plans. Um, we have to integrate cultural competence as well as input really from the access and functional needs community. Um, there's a change to boards and commission law that um, allows residents, whether citizens or not, to be eligible to serve on local uh, boards and commissions. And then in terms of voting and elections, um, SB 72 will require that voter registration be available at polling places uh, on election day. Uh, AB 49 places a timeline on when vote by mail ballots have to be sent out to uh, registered voters. Um, AB 571 imposes some campaign contribution limits on local officials to mirror um, what is required at the state okay, level. Let's, let's stop right there real quick. Yes. Uh, Joe Paul, uh, Angela, there she is. <laughs> Take it. You know exactly where I was going with it, didn't you? <laughs> I didn't even know this was going to be on the agenda. I stayed because I wanted to hear the, the great topics. And thing, uh, huh? <laughs> this is just four of 17 measures yes. or 17 uh, uh, pieces of legislation that have been adopted by and, and chaptered by the governor this year. We have seen a tremendous amount of legislation. Which question did you want to talk about? Uh, 571, oh. yeah. just for people that are running for current office with the okay, contribution cam limits. Com campaign contributions. So okay. this is going to be dealing with FPPC and your 460 filings, anybody that's running for office. It will have limits. I don't know the limits off the top of my head, but it does impose limits. We can get the, uh, I can get that to you guys and to anybody else at the public that would like well, to do, see. Do we want to do a special session for people that are, I know you do. I'm just, I once, actually, once you're up and going. I actually would really like, after we go to new law in December, yeah. do a presentation in uh, January, not just on that one, but on all of the impacts. The same day registration is a huge impact. As you know, it's a 15 day registration right now, so that gives us some time to stop and get everything going. Um, but I would, would like to thank the board um, because of the purchase of the um, new voting equipment and administration and for the um, grants that we're getting and for the technology we brought to the polls, which is our electronic poll books, we are prepared for this legislation, unlike some counties that are struggling right now to change out voting systems before the primary. So thank you. So I'd like to invite you back in January, definitely. And also just we need to educate everyone also. What I see is a same day registration. It's going to cause a lot of problems on uh, the 3rd of March when people think all the ballots are counted, but there's going to be a lot more that haven't been counted because we have to still go through the process of uh, determining if they are um, accurate. So. Right, and what this is going to do is it's going to allow um, to change parties on election day because yes. this is a party required um, uh, presidential election, so party does matter, and I will add that to my presentation in January. But um, it's not only going to be uh, extending how long it takes to process ballots, but it's going to be the education of the poll workers and understanding the rights of the voters. It's much more complicated than it's ever been before. I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but on before. the um, same day 
changing parties. Can you change one day and go back the next? No, once you vote, you don't get to vote again. Okay. So no, I'm talking about I'm talking yeah. about for you the primaries change, versus the general. You can change your party and then the next day re-register in another party. That's you can change your party by the minute online right now. Okay. And they do it just so you know. Mr. Chair, I think the AB 571 was $3,000 per calendar year, if um, my memory they, serves me correct. I thought it was 45, but. No, I think it's 3,000. They tied it into what the state yeah. um, senators and everybody else, uh, their oh, yeah. limits are, so. That sounds correct, because I, yeah. I recall that, but I didn't want to misspeak. I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I think that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Angela. Any other questions? So on the uh, quick question on the SB 225, that's Angela. is that uh, uh, all boards and commissions? I don't think uh, so. Yes, all local boards and commissions across the board. Correct. What about That's state correct. or? Yes, state. including state. Everything. Um, so that is about it. Um, there was a list of all the other bills, because there are quite a few um, attached to the agenda item. Um, but that concludes our presentation. Unless you have anything? Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to run into the... Uh, I, oh, I just wanted to add one more thing. Thank you both for working on that. I think it was a great presentation. Um, one of the things I, w I would like to highlight to the board is when you look at SB 160, AB 477, this is requires counties. SB 6 requires counties. AB 125 requires counties. The state is requiring local agencies to do a lot of these things, either collecting data, collecting, uh, doing work, data analysis, <coughs> and a lot of these don't cover the full cost. So obviously there's definitely a, a burden, um, and every year, um, I, I think that there's just additional work that's put upon us, but you know we're, we're doing our best to um, do that work, and we obviously wanted to share with the board some of these, uh, you know, the legislative items and the work that's going to go involved in the RMA office, because you know Harry's got a lot of work now. He's going to have to address some of the setbacks and a bunch of other things. So there's a ton of work that you'll be seeing over this next year uh, regarding uh, or relating to these legislative actions and making sure that our local ordinances comply. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. We'll move on to our uh, board announcements at this time before we go into a closed session. I'll start off with uh, Supervisor Hernandez. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had to take a deep breath while listening to all those legislations. I concur with Supervisor Dela Cruz. The state has become more of a burden than it realizes and maybe intentionally so but it's kind of frustrating um so what i've been involved with uh, uh this this last couple of weeks not much actually so the farmers market committee i know that's outside of the commission but i thought it'd be good to inform the board uh i'm, I'm part of that and i think it's kind of the focus is uh, downtown development um so it's uh, they're actually considering which the big mention i wanted to have is is a two weekend farmers market so there might be an opportunity for mm. capturing folks um from basically outside of the norm, you know, which is the Wednesday traffic, usually a lot of locals, you know, obviously people that, that uh, you know, that, that have that availability, it's limited. So this is going to be a little bit more of a focus, um, maybe at the beginning of the season, at the end of the season, to try to capture some of the new new folks that come, that live here and, and really don't spend their monies here. Um, so I also partook in a library meeting. I mentioned a little bit earlier that I don't support bond managers. I made sure to mention that to the group, I think actually it kind of created for a good discourse because ultimately the, one of the other council members, Honor Spencer, mentioned the same thing. Um, just because it forces us to get really, uh, um, to a certain extent, it kind of puts us in the innovative mode, you know, where we start to really consider what other opportunities do we have and, and, have, and trying to, if the public would support it, what that means uh, as far as costs for the public or even um, different revenue streams to sustain it. So sustainability was a big focus. And um, and then also considering uh, uh, things that would actually become marketable to the community. So it's not just a library focus, it's actually, which the old feasibility study mentioned, um, a tel center, technology, education, you know, CSUMB, I've been a part of those meetings. I know uh, our CAO went with me. Um, a couple other staff, I, if I recall, Dulce, I think, was there, and we, we uh, we sat down with the dean of the business of the business universe business 
uh, department for the university, and he he said that Sam, uh, Monterey is very interested, or CCMB is very interested in partnering with Samuel County to have an extension here. So it's not just uh, you know after school programs. It's actually they want to have a classroom for with a professor sitting here teaching university level or higher education. So I thought that was really really exciting. We definitely need to consider how to make that work if it's possible. Um, and uh, we had a sit down with. Again, my CAO and, and uh, um, Daryl from Environmental Health, and part of the focus was is understanding a little bit more of their cost mechanism for, for environmental health permits. Part of, you know, the, the main element is how do we try to attract businesses? And that's where it, you know, it's kind of nuts and bolts trying to come up with a streamlined process. Obviously trying to work with the city, I think would be a good opportunity for us to consider how we can come up with a streamlined process for, uh, for pop-ups or basically uh, you know, vendors. I know when we first started, first started our business, it was with a couple dollars in our pocket and just a couple, you know, a, one machine and a couple different things to start our business and eventually we've grown. So it's a good opportunity. That's why I thought it'd be really good to, to give others the same opportunity. Um, at the last meeting, I didn't get to mention, but you know that was also the second part of my my focus has been is to um, to try to bring a small business development center locally. I know we already have uh, a board member from the EDC that's that's part of that, but all things considered, a, a stronger presence, more workshops for small businesses to understand the kind of the barriers of entry to be successful in our community. So, uh, and, and w with that said, I think it was a, a really good conversation because SBDC from Salinas is interested in coming to, or at least having stronger workshops. And some of the things that they've done, even for branding and marketing purposes, has been um, the the Monterey Bay Startup Challenge, which is Monterey's version of the of the otter otter or the Shark Tank. So they call it the Otter Tank. So it's kind of trying to get people from out of the woodwork saying, hey, if you have an idea, let's vet it. Let's figure out if you understand what it means to start a business or at least help you to understand what it means to start a business. So it's really, really good opportunity and uh, to try to see what the potential is in San Mateo County. And that's considering SBDC probably puts 13% of their time, um, the last time I sat with them, in San Mateo County. So this would give them a greater focus to invest in our community. Uh, the last thing I want to mention, mention, Mr. Chair, I'm really excited about the meeting coming up this Wednesday with our RMA director. Harry, and that's going to be with this uh, lady. She's the assistant to the CAO of an organization called Chriscom, and uh, she she's uh, she's basically she's part of a firm that goes out and vets potential sites for Big League Dreams. So basically, they got hired by Big League Dreams, which for for some of you, I think believe I believe know is a organization that creates sports complexes and very successful at it. They have, I believe, eleven if I'm not mistaken, across the country. Seven of them are in California. The closest one we have is in Man is Manteca. And um, this would basically be a, a good opportunity for a public-private partnership. They come obviously with a strong name, very successful name and to a certain extent. And the, the most exciting part of it is the lady mentioned they're really interested in bringing one to San Mateo County. So that's, that's, you know, at that point, it becomes a, a good potential opportunity for us to see some, some really good economic development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Supervisor Dela Cruz. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I went to two San Bruno County Libraries meetings, both discussions on bonds and what is the future of the new library. I'm sorry, what's the future of the library, the way it's going to look. Uh, there was a discussion that maybe uh, they should they want to come back to the board and see where they fit in terms of uh, future facilities on this block. And I told them that I would talk to Ray about it and. <coughs> see what, what role they can play. Um, i also like to congratulate uh, Supervisor Jim Gillia for being named business, uh, um, what is it, philanthropy, business, good good man of the year, so, 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 <laughs> some the, stuff that uh, the, those guys the, the that the Tropic business council man did. Of the year. Yeah, and I, I really want to congratulate you. you. You did a lot to the community, and, and thank you. Um, I also want to thank uh, Supervisor, uh, our chairman, for uh, invited me to that to that night. Um, unfortunately, I had an, other family commitments to go, so I only stayed for a little while. Um, I attended the um, Billy Avery uh, retirement party last Thursday. Um, it was kind of funny. I've uh, been in government for a long time and public service for a long time. I've seen about three to five city um, city managers and p police chief and uh, fire uh, departments. I said, "Wow." Um, also, uh, I want to thank uh, Ray, his staff, uh, for doing a good job of moving forward on the sports complex. We're soon to have another meeting, and 
and I'm listening to Supervisor Hernandez where he's trying to bring in the field dreams concept and there might be an opportunity which we can both work together. So but that's a good thing, it's a good sign and look forward to working with the rest of the staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Supervisor Patello. I don't have a whole lot. Um, you know, I, I just have a couple of concerns. I think uh, the public brought up uh, something that we probably should do need to look into with this um, uh, therapeutic services or what have you. I, I see that we could become the destination of a, a of a more larger urban area for this type of services being located down here just because we're cheaper and uh, I, I maybe we should weigh our options as far as how we uh, respond to this and uh, and if there is anything we can do I, I want to support the chair with this issue in, in his district and it could be in any of our districts uh, as as, uh, as time goes on and the second thing um, that I talked to uh, our RMA director a bit about this and for, it doesn't need to be done next month or or January maybe February or March whenever we get get back from the, the holidays but Highway 156 is going to be widened the starting construction in um, 2020 in the summer and uh, it's a be more or less a three-year project uh, and that intersection at uh, Union Road is part of that project I, and I just want to see if there's any um, efficiencies that you know if we could extend the turn um, the northern turn lanes even beyond the project area I, I don't think there's a problem with you know the the lane that goes to um, south of Hollister but turning uh, there, there's a high volume of cars and if we widen that even further than what the plans suggest if there's an opportunity to do so with uh, impact fees that we should be collecting uh, or with uh, some other funding sources maybe that would help um, that intersection flow a lot more better especially with all the housing uh, uh, building up in the south of Hollister something to look at anyway and be a little bit more proactive so that's kind of all I have oh one more thing let the guys know thank you for finally getting to the mowing on in West Hollister I mean San, uh, San Juan Batista and Romas area they uh, we finally got that mode and we uh, I had a couple of phone calls and people really appreciate that thank you Supervisor Gilu. I'll start off my report with uh, the way I always do thanking our uh, team members and all our departments but also uh, in particular roads my my departments or my uh, district our district and district four is very road intensive and needs a lot of uh, work and repairs and I appreciate every time I have to um, send another complaint or email over and I see um, director Maverick is in the front row there so if you could pass along that to the team and I, I always do as well and I will again I uh, had a busy uh, couple weeks mr. chair with community activities but um, being so late in the day and it's almost lunchtime I uh, I think they're pretty much covered by everybody else here in the community with the exception of, uh, on the board with the exception of the Technova Science Fair um, Technova is a uh, local business that's growing and providing a lot of living wage jobs in our community they did an amazing uh, science fair over the weekend uh, and they had um, not only science projects for kids to be involved in they had the 4-h out there boy scouts uh, you name it everybody was out there the groups and it was a really positive event for our community there's a lot going on if you get off social media and take a look and see what's happening out in the community there's a lot of great things to do out there uh, one thing that i think we need to pay close attention to mr chair that i would hope um, we can uh, either uh, behind the scenes work on or we can uh, potentially bring to the board is 4-h funding if you take a look at the uh, UC Cooperative Extension budget on page 29 towards the bottom you'll see uh, d departmental uh, concerns or agency concerns and it talks about uh, the uh, elimination of the funding for uh, the 4-H coordinator position unfortunately statewide not just for San Benito County and um, there is a, a lot of different numbers floating around but I have spoke with our new UC Cooperative um, Extension manager and um, 
the bottom line is uh, there, there's about a $20,000 need to keep the amount of service that we have in San Benito County only. Currently, our um, cooperative extension serves three counties, Santa Cruz, Monterey, and San Benito. And if those counties don't want to participate, our need would be a, a, about that amount. But um, perhaps if behind the scenes it needs to come to the board for some sort of direction or thoughts or approval, it's a uh, critical um, uh, leadership and uh, training organization I think for our youth and I, I definitely want to support and continue working on that. Mr. Chair, if I may, so we've already met. I want to make sure that you know, the board's aware of that. Um, both Stuart and I uh, met and uh, we've, we're looking at other ideas and options which I think we've, we've found some other funding that we might be able to subsidize this so we'll keep you posted. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And then one last thing I want to say that I didn't, it wasn't on the uh, consent agenda. I want to really, uh, it was on the consent agenda. I want to just call it out real quick and thank our staff and our team for getting it together. I think, Dulce, are you here? There you are. I think you're the one who uh, put it all together and got on the agenda was the letter of support for a CAL FIRE grant. It was critical. So the, Lauren, sorry. Lauren's like, no, it was me. <laughs> she would never say that, by the way. She's uh, very humble. Uh, so uh, we, we got a call. Uh, I got a call like a Wednesday of last week saying, hey, we need a letter of support to get this on the uh, agenda. And I said, you know what, let's get it on the agenda. Maybe not just a letter from me, maybe a letter from the whole board, because it's a, uh, it's a great uh, grant to provide training on um, reducing uh, fuel for fires. So control burns and that sort of thing. And we, uh, today, you guys all supported that. And I wanted to appreciate that and recognize staff because it was very last minute. Thank you for doing that. That uh, takes us to closed session, Barbara. One oh, right. other thing, if, if I may, I know that we were looking at possibly creating an ad hoc for economic development or economic uh, allocations. Would your, oh, thank you. if you don't mind, Mr. Chair? Peter. I would definitely be interested, I'm, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Okay. Peter and Jaime. Thank you. Thank you. Num number 25, closed session conference with legal counsel, a conference with legal counsel regarding anticipated litigation, initiation of litigation pursuant to subdivision D4 of government code section 54956.9, number of cases 1. 26, closed session conference with labor negotiators as agency designated representatives Doug Johnson, Ray Espinoza, Edgar Nolasco, Stuart Patry, Velvia El Barocchio, and Barbara Thompson, Employee Associations, Institutions Association, Law Enforcement Management, Management Employees Group, SEIE Local 521, Deputy Sheriff's Association, Confidential Employees, Confidential Management, and Appointed Department Heads. And unrepresented employees pursuant to 54957.6. Closed session conference with legal counsel, existing litigation. Number of cases once pursuant to subdivisions A and D, one of 54956.9. Name of the case is NRA National Prescription Opiate Litigation, uh, United States District Court, Northern District of Ohio, Eastern District. Case number MDL 2804. Case number is. 1 7, I mean 117 MD 2804 and lastly 28 which is closed session conference legal counsel uh, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to subdivisions D2 E2 of government code section 54956.9 number of cases one um, additional litigation potential related to the uh, letter received by preserve our rural communities dated October 21st 2019 any public comment public comment See none. Close session.